Hmm. Hello. <laughs> I'm not used to doing a cold open. Let's see. We're back now. Let's check and see if this works. Testing. Yeah. Okay. We'll just try our best and see how she goes. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, can confirm the neighbors are moving. Um, and so what had happened was the mother um, of the neighbor asked if she could park in front of my like garage for a minute. And I'm like, that's fine, that's cool. Um, and then, so that's when I got the lowdown. Cause I was like, oh, are you moving? Like, are they moving? Is that, is that what's going on? And she was like, yeah, they're moving today. Um, because the, the other, the woman, she's pregnant and blah, blah, blah. And so they got this place and everything's moving around so fast. And I was like, oh my God, like, I had like no idea, like we sort of maybe suspected cause we had stuff going on, but really we, you know, wow, like amazing, good for you guys sort of thing. And, um, and uh, yeah, and so she was saying that the woman is um, due in like two weeks. So they obviously timed it like perfectly um, where, they're able to get into this place. Cause I know, cause I said, oh, like, is it because you need like, a, I obviously need a bigger place. What the fuck is going on now? It is pushing it. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, it could have all fallen through. Cause that's what happened to um, my partner, like to Liam's cousin is they were expecting and buying a place and the baby came before the place got sorted. Like that's just kind of what happens sometimes. Why isn't it doing the thing? There we go. Okay. That's all I needed. But yeah, so yeah, so they're doing two and she's doing two weeks. So they moved in and because I know they have, they already have two girls. So they have one is like. I don't know, like a preteen, one's a kid. Um, and I know when they first moved in, it was really important for the parents that these kids had their own rooms because they had never had their own rooms before. And so I was like, yeah, it kind of, I guess, might've been a dick move to be like, okay, we've moved into this place so you guys can have your own rooms. And now one of you has to share with a baby and you're like a full on child, you know? So yeah, and so, wild but it was really sweet because the woman was talking about how her granddaughter um the older daughter said bye to shadow yesterday i guess she told her grandma like oh yeah i made sure to say bye to shadow and i was like that's really sweet so yeah and now shadow, he's up here now but he was being a bit nosy later i think we'll like officially go and say hi and like introduce ourselves later um but yeah so now, more goss. Who's moving into the house? Is it seems like, at least the, the, they, they, so the old neighbors told us that it is a woman and her son. Um, and so it looks like now, from my looks of it, it looks sort of like a woman, probably like, I don't know, it looks like she's in her 50s. So I assume that she has like an, a young adult son anywhere from you know like early 20s to mid 20s is my assumption um but yeah so we shall see but it was interesting because i was talking again to this woman and she was like yeah you know i think i don't know if it's like as a, of a byproduct of a separation or something like that but the the woman was like yeah i wonder you know like she's downsizing and so she's moving into here and i'm like you're downsizing into a three-bedroom house like, what were they living in before? If if a three bedroom house is a downsize, you know what I mean? I'm like, if you wanted, like, that's wild. But I don't know, because it could be, you do think about it by the time it's like, I don't know, a three bed house, I feel like especially too, if people work from home and like what those circumstances are, it's like the third bedroom is usually an office. 
that's kind of what we've done with this, where this is like the office stream situation, um, which is, you know what I mean? So yeah, so wild, wild times. Yeah, exactly. Is like get one of those sort of situations and then have an office set up. So who knows, but we'll see. Like the only thing, this is like really, I don't know if it's kind of shitty of me, but I'm kind of like, oh, like if this is kind of an older woman moving into this house, she'll probably be a little bit more chill. And what I'm assuming is like a bit more considerate. Like she's not going to have like ragers where people are getting shit faced and forgetting to move their cars. You know what I mean? But who knows? Maybe her son is a rager. I don't know. Or she's a rager. You don't know. Just because you're older doesn't mean that you don't rage. <laughs> we don't know. We'll see. But yeah, so new exciting things, which is which is fun. But speaking of things, we got shit to do. <laughs> we got stuff to do today. Um, I have three more of these bad boys that I need to completely finish wrapping. So they're in various stages of completion. Basically, they look like this, right? Cute, sweet, they open up. They're basic and boring. So, not that I, you know, didn't want a stressor on my hand. We're now turning them into this. With the final stage being that these raised portions will then be gold, which is very exciting, um, but that's another step. And I realized that maybe I wasn't, um, I was working harder, not smarter because I get bored. <laughs> I think I was getting bored. And so just decoupaging was doing my head in. So I was like, I'll decoupage, then I'll do the painting and then I'll, you know, backing and forthing, which I'm reflecting now was not the move because now I just have a bunch of half finished things instead of finishing the entire process and then moving on to the next process. Cause I think the biggest step obviously is the decoupage portion itself, which I've explained before is basically like decorative paper mache where we take bits of paper, rip them into tinier pieces of paper and then use glue and glue them on this in a fun textured way but yeah so so yes so there are three left to do um i didn't end up going and picking up average stream bit rate is too high i don't know how to fix that it's saying it's okay I think sometimes the Twitch backend doesn't like um, update itself consistently, frequently, and then it doesn't look correct. Let me see if it's faring any better. Whoa, I keep also accidentally sticking my elbow to this paper, which isn't good. But I wonder if I set up chat on my laptop, if that will be better because then I won't be focusing on how shitty everything looks on this back end. But we'll see. It might just be that everything is a bit unstable today and we will try and just persevere through it. I could very much be overthinking it. So if things look, sound, seem okay, um, let me know if it's all just my laptop and in my brain. Um, and I won't worry about it because this looks up to date, that looks up to date and things seem to be okay. So we're just going to go with it <laughs> is what's going to happen. Okay. Don't, don't, don't look at the bit rate stuff. Don't be concerned with that. Um, but yeah, so we got to work on this because I want to finish them. Ideally, I wanted to get them done by the end of the week. The boss ladies are taking, ooh, wowie wow, your ladies who lunch, how fabulous. Where are you going for lunch? Where is the lunching going to occur? Okay, the edges of these are already done. So one of the things that I'm doing 
um, is taking the straight edges of the places um, of the paper and using them to line them up over the edges of the box just to make my life easier because I don't really want to wrap this because I don't want there to be potential stickage. Oh, is that what's going on? My laptop wasn't plugged in, so maybe that's what the problem is. Is it was like, we're working too hard. And now we're stressed out. <laughs> there we go. Now it's plugged in. Now maybe that will be helpful. Because it, it's not trying to do the battery preservation thing as well. The salads are like, really? Ooh. Honestly, season, that sounds bougie. It sounds like a bougie steakhouse. That's the vibe I'm getting just from the title. You know what I mean? Yeah, this already seems a million times better. I think it was genuinely just because my laptop was freaking out that it wasn't plugged in. And it was like, why are you trying to make me stream when I'm on like 2% and not plugged in? Okay, I feel better about this now. We can put, put this to bed. That's interesting. But I guess if they're, tr are they treating you? Do you need to pay for it? Just cause they're taking you to lunch. Does that mean that lunch is on them? Cause that will drastically change what you're going to be ordering from this bougie establishment. Okay. Let's see what's going on here. The one thing that I thought was really cute about this, it's, oh, Oh, that's amazing. Excellent. Well then pff, bring on the $20 salad. <laughs> the thing that's really cute about this. So I guess this is brand name decoupage stuff. So this is a brand called decoupatch. So they do the paper and also the glue and, and these actually. And so all of this, all of this, but I noticed that there's a little notch in here and look, the little glue brush sits in the notch so you don't get glue all over your counter. I was like, that's an ingenious design choice. Ooh, helps if I use it properly. But I think that that's really clever. I'm like, wow, check that out. Right, ingenuity and design. That's really cool though. I like that they actually like do nice things for their admin. Does anything actually, like, does anything look good? Or does it just look overpriced and unappetizing? You know what I mean? You're indifferent. Oh, okay, yeah. Cause do you find, are you like, not like a, like a foodie per se? Like, do you like trying new things or are you very much like, textures are weird for me. Like there's only certain things that I can really sort of handle. And if a menu gets too fancy, then it's like, nah, you know what I mean? I'll take a look at that. Probably get a flat butter salad. Yeah. Textures are really weird for me. Yeah. Oh, I need to select a location. Well, it's a chain, so that's cool. There we go. Let's look at the Memphis one. Lunch. View the menu. It's Birmingham, yeah. I'm sure it's mostly the same, I don't know. The flatbreads look cute. Those look really nice. Starters, a lump crab cake. I don't know if you want a lump. That doesn't sound appetizing, like a lump of crab. Though, to be fair, to me, a lump of crab sounds amazing. But I feel like describing it as a lump is, a, is an interesting thing. Ooh, they have avocado toast. How much is their avocado toast? I want to know. It's not, t oh, nine, nine. 9.50 for some avocado toast. That feels comparable. 
ahi tuna tartare. Soups, salads, entrees. Ooh, mahi tuna crunch salad. Wowie wow. This does look pretty bougie. This is like an elevated steakhouse. They have scallops. They, yeah, they have scallops. They got surf and turf. You know if they got surf and turf, they're a little bit bougie. Make it a Caesar salad and pesto chicken flatbread. Very nice. Lump crab. Oh, this is actually crab and not fake crab. Oh, interesting. Lump crab means real crab. Cause obviously I know like, cause I know that's a thing with um, California rolls, like sushi California rolls. They use crab sticks, which is not real crab. It's like basically the hot dog version of crab meat. Um, and so I can't have California rolls because then obviously to reconstitute crab into a stick form, you need to have something that binds it and they bind it with gluten. So I can't have California rolls um, because they use like, literally their recipe is artificial crab meat. Like that's part of it. Um, but I didn't realize that then to, for it to be real, it's called lump. That's funny to me. Yeah. There's other ones. I think that's why I ended up, um, I do a lot of like salmon avocado rolls or yeah. So basically, but you know, obviously if I'm ordering like salmon avocado rolls and like tuna rolls with the real fish, that's more expensive than the, uh, than the California rolls, unfortunately. But you know, that, that it'd be that way. Not that I don't even know, like, well, I'm trying to think if I, genuinely would have enjoyed like enjoyed them probably but yeah i just you know i was not that i already didn't love um salmon and like tuna in my like sushi choices so the choice to have the cheaper option was taken away from me if i wanted fish fish because <laughs> it was like artificial fish but um, I guess if I really wanted to, I could just order like cucumber avocado rolls and stuff, but like, that's not fun. <laughs> that's not fun. But that's nice though. That should be nice. I like Philly rolls. Yeah, is that the cream cheese ones? That's the salmon cream cheese one, isn't it? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's so funny because sometimes restaurants call them something different. And I think one time I was at a restaurant and they called it a cheese roll. And then I was like, I don't know what fresh hell I'm getting ordering that because every once in a while, I think I've ordered something where it's like an egg something. And then I end up getting this like brick of like tofu egg and it's the grossest texture ever. So sometimes I'm like, Ooh, I don't know if I trust that. But then once my friend was like, no, no, the dairy, like the, the Philly one that the cheese roll means that. Um, but until I knew that I was like, unless it's called like a Philly cheese roll or they called it like a something different, or if you can see a picture, like if I could see a picture of it and then I could be like, that's obviously the role that I am interested in. But sometimes you read something and I'm like, I don't know what it is. Or again, the gluten free of it all. There were some restaurants that they would like sprinkle tempura flakes on top of their rolls. So the roll itself might be gluten free, but then I say gluten free. I'm sure if it had soy sauce, it was potentially like not, but sometimes what would happen is they would like, I remember there was this restaurant that we ordered sushi from one time. Um, and yeah, all the, all the rolls came covered in crunchy tempura bits. And I'm like, that's gluten. You just ruined my sushi with gluten asshole. Um, I think I was a bit chill about it though. We just kind of like scraped it off and tried my best, but in retrospect, that probably wasn't a good idea. I probably still got cross-contaminated, but you know, needs must. <laughs> we have a super crunch thing here. That is a crunchy bite on the inside and fish on top. Ooh, mm -hmm. that sounds nice though. And that's the thing I do, like if that was something that I could consume, I do like the concept of like a crunchy component to a sushi roll. I think that's a really good idea. I do like when there's different textural components to a food. Um, it's just that, you know, unless it's gluten free, I don't get the luxury, <laughs> but yeah, I also really like to, again, with the eel and stuff, there was these like, um, fried eel sushi rolls I really liked, but I think sometimes too, what happens with the eel is then it has a sauce that's like, it'll be marinated in like a soy sauce or marinated in something that, 
you know, usually nine times out of 10, even if it's not strictly soy sauce, if it's a different kind of sauce, the base will usually have soy sauce in it. And again, most soy sauces, even though soy is gluten-free, soy sauce usually has wheat in it. Um, so then that becomes a problem. So you just, you gotta, I just can't order anything fancy. I just need the basic raw ingredients wrapped up in some seaweed covered with rice and call it a day. Um, anytime they start to, anytime they add a sauce or a deep fry or any sort of, you know, little, little zhuzh, I'm like, now it's got gluten. <laughs> we just need the raw ingredients, you guys. But yeah, that's cool though. I'm excited for your lunch. I spent the, uh, aside from, you know, creeping on next door and figuring out what the hell is going on, um, with, with then finding out that they're moving. Um, the rest of the morning was spent uh, taking Shadow for a W and then consuming all of the, I've been watching clips of A. Oh yeah, usually, yeah. That's what I figured. I figured if you had, if you're, if, if you have to, not that you're, but I figured if you're going out for lunch, you probably will be bowing out a little bit earlier today, which is fine. Cause I want you to get a paid for lunch at a bougie restaurant. I want what's best for you, Kat. And sometimes it means being away from me, which makes me sad, but I know it's in your best interest. <laughs> I'm like, I want, I want good things for you. <laughs> I want you to order $20 salad and feel no remorse and enjoy every morsel of it. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so instead, well, first of all, first, you don't understand why the industry is not corn flour. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah, I don't understand either. I'm not sure what the appeal. I guess maybe it's cheaper. That's usually the default, isn't it? I assume that it's cheaper. Or easier to come by or who knows. You know what I mean? But... I need to show you my mom. Yeah. Oh no. How is she? Is she home? I was thinking about you yesterday. I was like, fuck. I hope that after that happened, she was okay. She fractured her humerus. Well, that's not very humorous, is it? I'll see myself out. Um, that sucks. So it wasn't just, it's not just the bruising. Jeez. And was it, it was like her, her sugar levels and stuff that were not sorted yeah she's at home yeah 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 yeah. no that's fair that's fair i appreciate that <laughs> no she's a shuffler oh okay that that sucks wow oh man She's got to pick up her feet. That's frustrating. Just gonna wait a million years for Discord to boot up. Yeah. You see that? Like, like that was something that happened a lot with um when my mom, like my mom was a nurse at like a like a rehabilitation. I guess it was a hospital, rehab hospital. Um, and it was a lot of like, it was older women obviously, like that would have fallen and then broke hips and whatever and were in rehab and oh my God, that's massive. Sorry guys, I don't really wanna show you, <laughs> but oh man, that's gonna turn all the colors, isn't it? At least the swelling went down on her f head but her eyes a little worse for wear wow i remember so when i was in primary school in senior kindergarten so we were like what five or six um one of my best friends 
ran head first. Like, I don't know. I can't even remember what happened. I think she hit her head off like the corner of a cabinet or something, but she basically got a big old goose egg dead center of her forehead. Like it looked like her third eye had opened. You know what I mean? Like that was, that was where it was. So it didn't get cut open, but it was, it was clearly a thing. Hi, potato. Good morning. Good morning. Have you got your warm comfort beverage to wake you up to start the day? Um, but yeah, so she had this big old goose egg in the center of her forehead and it turned every single color a bruise could. Like first it was like completely black. Then it was purple. Then it was yellow. Like it was honestly like it went through a transformation. And then it was really funny because then like, I feel like it wasn't even a week later. There was this girl in our, in our class that we like weren't really friends with. But for some reason, there was this sort of thing where she always seemed to be trying to copy my friend. And we were kind of like, this is really weird. And obviously it could have been a complete happenstance. It would have been kind of psycho behavior if she had done this intentionally. But like a week after my friend had her massive ever changing gobstopper of a goose egg in the middle of her forehead, this girl got the same thing. Middle of the forehead goose egg. And she had been like known to us in our little six year old friend group as being like a copycat to my friend. And so it was this thing where it's like concerning, but like, you know, when, when my friend got the big old goose egg, it was like, oh my God, wow. Like, I'm so sorry. Like, I hope, and then she got it and we were like, you're just copying her. You know what I mean? Like, but in retrospect, I'm like, unless she, you know, is a sociopath, I don't think she is. I've seen her later in life and I think she's fine. You know what I mean? Like I, who knows? But yeah, I just remember all of us being like, whatever, you're just copying her. <laughs> and it's like, she probably had a legitimate head trauma and we were just like, mm, okay. <laughs> yes, I spent 10 minutes outside. Ooh, that's so nice. That sounds amazing. Taking in the world and your warm go-go juice. But yeah, but I feel like bruising, like I guess, yeah oh yeah exactly right that's true yeah it uh it's such a it's such a strange strange thing like i said we have no idea she very well could have <laughs> so what i've been doing is all of the kind of predetermined um straight edges i've been cutting them up or like ripping them from that point and then using the straight edges along the edges of the box. And then the parts that aren't straight edges, I've just been ripping those and then adding them. So I've kind of been like backing and forthing with some of these. That's why both of these are in current states of completion. Cause I'm using the, the hard edges to cover this and then using the soft edges to finish covering the rest of this project. So that's why we're jumping around, but not as much. Cause I'm trying to have like, craft discipline, I guess. Um, and not paint the other ones before I finish decoupaging the first ones. Thank you. Yeah. I have three more to cover. One is still completely naked. These two are in the process. And then this one is one of the ones that's completely done. Um, the next step, once they're completely done is I'm going to paint these raised edges white, um, to give a base to then paint them gold. Because as we found, I was talking about it on Tuesday where I just put the gold straight on the box and it needed like three coats. And I was like, we're going to see this through. Maybe in retrospect, I shouldn't have covered the entire thing and I should have left these edges exposed, making it easier to paint them. Um, but then, you know, once you start, I don't know, for me, I'm like, I have this issue where I'm like, even if this maybe isn't the most logical way to achieve this, I've already done the majority of them like this. And so my desire for uniformity is outweighing my efficiency. Do you know what I mean? Cause I'm pretty sure if I didn't cover these edges, they would make them much easier to paint, but because all of the edges on the other ones are covered and I want them all to look the same. I therefore am now doing this and potentially making extra work for myself, but they're all meant to look the same. Like that is the point. So I need to try to achieve that point, even if it's inefficient in terms of doing the thing. Do you know what I mean? 
So that's that is that is a problem that I have, but it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. So yeah. But we're on the home stretch. I didn't bother, so I did end up ordering more. So remember I told you guys, I went to pick up my dress on Tuesday and then I was like, oh, I need, I'm pretty sure I need more of this. I only have one sheet left and I don't think that's enough to cover three boxes completely. Maybe it is. And then I'm going to be kicking myself because I ordered three from Hobbycraft and it said click and collect from an hour. And then I was like, oh, okay, cool. So I can go get my dress, drive over to Hobbycraft and pick them up. And then I got an email saying, like once I placed the order, being like, oh, um, in the next 24 hours, your order will be ready. We'll send you an email when you can come and collect it. And I was like, shit, if I had known that, I would have just like taken the risk and gone to the store and picked it up and not worried about it. To be fair, I probably still could have done that, but I already ordered it. So I don't think you can cancel an order once you've already bought a click and collect order. I could return it maybe with that. Just, it seemed like more hassle to just like wait it out. And then I was talking about this and I even said, Kat was here, Kat will bear witness. I think other people might've been here as well. And I was like, this bullshit and I have to wait 24 hours and how much you want to bet now that I'm home, they've probably emailed me. And sure enough, it was not click and collect from an hour. So two hours later, once I had already come home and started streaming, I had gotten an email. And I was like, well, I have already left the house twice today. I am not going to do this a third time because that is my own thing. To be fair, the fact that I take shadow for like long walks every day, I count that as me leaving the house. So I'm like, I've been a social human. I have gone out in the world and interacted with society. I, I'm i done. I've reached my, my limit. I do not need to do that anyway. So then if I have appointments and have other things I have to do, obviously if it's an appointment and I've made a scheduled commitment to do a thing, I will do it. But if it's something like this, where it's like, I even checked the email, I have two weeks. I have up to two weeks to come and collect those. So you best believe I'm making it not my problem for the next couple of days. So obviously if I run out of supplies to complete this, I'll probably pick it up on the weekend. But it was one of those things where I'm like, I'm already stressed and I don't want to leave the house more times than I need to in a row. <laughs> this is my own thing that I do to myself. I'm like, it's fine. Fuck it. I'm going to just leave it. <laughs> so... <laughs> that that's where we're at but they're holding it for two weeks so it's fine because originally i was like damn it if i don't go pick it up they're gonna stick it back on the floor and i'm gonna not have any it's gonna be a big old to do and then i read that they'll hold it for two weeks and i'm like that sounds like a future tasha problem now but yeah so but now like i said i don't think it's gonna cover them i don't think i needed to order three more of these because that's what i originally had i originally had three because there's eight boxes and six of them, no, F five, five of them are completely covered. And I have three left to cover, two are sort of half covered, one's completely not, and I have one sheet of paper left. So I'm thinking I maybe only needed to order one more pack, but I panicked, naturally. Um, so I ended up ordering three. I guess what I could have done is completed what I had and then assessed once I had completely run out of decoupage paper, being like, hmm, how much more do I need? What What is left? But my brain doesn't think like that. My brain goes, I had three, I managed to cover three, so therefore I must need three more. You know what I mean? One of those. It's okay though. So, yeah. <laughs> it's a process, it's fine. But it's coming together. I was getting a bit frustrated. I think that's the other thing too, is because this, project has to happen in stages I one get bored and two get nervous and anxious because even though I'm in the process of completing everything not one of them is completely done yet and so it feels like the completion of this project seems so much farther away because nothing is officially done um everything is currently in a state of complete like half completion um, but yeah, I just need to be like, listen, it makes more sense. And you know, even though there's many parts of my life 
and this process that I'm not being efficient in, I think in order to maximize what I'm doing. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing. That's the other thing too, right? That was something, and to be fair, I thought about this as well, where I'm, because again, I had this thing where I was like, oh, maybe I could have outsourced this. Like I could have, you know, sat down, done a thing, gotten, you know, fam together and done this. And then, you know, then, then the perfectionism, possibly control freak issue of it all kicks in. And again, because I'm in a quest for uniformity, the concern is, well, if I get someone to help me, then mine might look different than theirs and therefore there's no more uniformity and that's not okay. <laughs> so that is another concern. <laughs> Honestly, guys, like I've been going through a journey with this um, decoupage situation and I am learning a little bit about myself. Maybe stuff I've already known, but maybe some stuff that I'm realizing I still need to unpack a little bit. <laughs> I'm like, hmm, interesting. <laughs> I'm like, do I have control perfectionism issues that I don't manifest often, but are clearly manifesting in this? interesting interesting to be fair i have asked my brother-in-law for help on this oh no yeah oh it's okay i appreciate your work lurk uh i hope the day goes well i always appreciate when you stop by and say hi and enjoy the rest of your day um but yeah so i have outsourced the labeling so basically what we want to do is have all of the kids names custom Cricut design on this. So I bought the material, but of course I myself do not have a Cricut. Um, my brother-in-law does. And so I have asked him to help me do this. And so they're coming, like he's coming over this weekend, but he has to work first. So I don't know if they're going to remember to bring it. Um, but of course he's like, yeah, yeah. Like we'll come over and like, we'll play and figure out what we want and i think it'll be really good but the closer it gets to the due date like the closer it gets to the fact that my parents are literally rocking up at the end of next week i just want it done so i need us to be efficient basically i'm like no play only focus you know what i mean but again i'm sure it'll be fine that's another reason why i wanted to get these done by the end of the week is because if he's coming over um this weekend and he does bring his cricket then we can like get it done that day. But obviously it's not gonna work if not all of them are completed. So that is where I'm at. But I also have to remind myself that there is still a week. Um, Cause basically I've told you guys how, like the reception's on the 26th, but my family's all rocking up on like the 19th, 20, like the 20th, 21st. So I wanna have everything done before they arrive. Um, this is true, this is true. We do have calligraphy experts in the house. Um, but yes, it's also, again, needing to trust that the person that I have asked to do the request will be able to comply. Um, you know, having that, let that, so that basically, I've already outsourced a part of this task um, in a way. So, but yeah, so I wanna get all of this done before they arrive. And also, I think part of it too is I wanted to get stuff done kind of towards the, put it up, towards the end of the week because next week I think is all like, there's reception prep and there's also prepping the house and stuff for visitors. So it's two separate things that are happening. And also the week that my parents are here, um, before the reception every other day we have an activity and i you know we we're together quite frequently um all of us together here i don't get out much aside from you know taking shadow for walks and when i do it's like oh one activity per two weeks probably much an activity a month like that's outside of my schedule i'm a very schedule oriented person it helps me control my anxiety when I have structure, like that's been like that my whole life and I have to recognize and understand that. So I'm a very structure oriented person who doesn't plan things outside of my structure 
um, very often because as an anxious introvert, I then need time to recharge from the deviation from the routine. Even if this thing is really exciting and I'm really looking forward to it and it's gonna be really fun, it is still a deviation from a structure that helps me manage my anxiety levels, right? So even if things can be good and exciting, they can still be draining. And so I then need efficient recovery time. What is happening, which again, my parents, again, my mom, like they're quite, um, also like my mom is also quite an introverted person she's realized that over time that she does like to get out and do stuff but she then also needs recharge time so as of right now things are like we are doing activities with sort of a day to recharge in between but like kind of not you know what i mean and so i'm going from maybe once a month having a deviation from the structure of my life to basically every day for the next two and a half weeks. And also there's a reception, you know what I mean? And so it's like, there's activities, there's extenuating planning circumstances. Um, and then the fact that there's visitors coming over, you also need to like get the house ready. You know what I mean? Cause as of right now, all the stuff in our, like all the reception stuff is stored in the spare bedroom. So then we need, there's like an order of operations chess game that's being played because I'm still streaming next week. But I assume once I'm done, like not streaming for the week, all of the reception stuff has to come out of the spare bedroom, just be stooshed willy nilly across the craft table. And already my computer desk is full of junk, like full of stuff just to make room, have moving pieces and stuff. Right. And so that's something that's happening next week. So I want to get all of the reception stuff done this week or, you know, for the most part, so that next week I can focus on preparing for guests in my home. You know what I mean? So yeah, there's like a lot of stuff um, and a lot of stuff that can't all happen all at once and has to happen sort of like at incremental specific times. So yeah, <laughs> because basically there are some things like leading up to the reception that can only really be done um, leading, like literally beforehand. So I think Thursday is gonna be a bit of a manic day before the reception because I need to do things like, you know, just dumb stuff like shave and like paint my nails and like do reception hygiene preppy stuff. But then also like, our party favor is one of the things that we're doing is we're giving um, biscuits. We're doing tea and biscuits, but the b biscuits are going in these like custom bags. I've showed them to you guys with like the custom thank you for coming stickers. So you can't stuff biscuits in bags that are not airtight like a week before because they'll go stale, right? And we don't need any stale biscuits <laughs> at the reception. So the day before we're probably gonna be stuffing biscuits we also have to, you know, take Shadow for his big walk. We gotta, you know, do different things. And then also there's the entertaining of the family of it all, right? And like, they're pretty self-sufficient. Like they can keep to themselves, but it's also like, that is a thing, right? And I think as much like as people are in your space and you love them and you care about them, again, it's a deviation from the norm and from your schedule. And I can, you know, I know I can turn off in front of my family and do those sorts of things, but it's like still, you know, we're gonna have, for instance, we're gonna have a room of the house that's basically out of commission because that's gonna become their space, their home away from home. And so then what's currently taking up that space then needs to be put elsewhere and all that kind of stuff. So as you can hear, I am a little bit stressed. It'll all work out and it's fine like and I just need to tell myself there is enough time to do things like it will be okay but it's still a lot mentally and I also am aware that I am somebody who has a lot of like anticipatory anxiety so it's not even like I can tell myself like it's gonna be fine and everything's gonna be great and you know we'll deal with whatever issues if they happen cool 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 but it doesn't stop the physical sensation that happens in my body 
in anticipation of a major change to my schedule, if that makes sense. So, yeah. <laughs> so, yes. So, Kat, you're the same. Cool. Are we, again, it's one of those where, you know, we are the same person in some of our more fabulous traits and also the same person in some of our more frustrating traits <laughs> in the why can't I just fucking go with the flow and be chill, you know? <laughs> I'm like, I'm sorry, I have no chill. I have chill, but within very strict parameters. And when I am, you know, it's, it's, isn't it interesting where like, it's such a juxtaposition and such like an oxymoron to be like, I can be chill when my life is structured, <laughs> which seems like the exact counterintuitive thing of like, you can't be chill if you're structured. And you're like, no, actually that is when I am the most chill. When I have a routine, when I know what to expect, when I like, you know, go about my life, things are good. Yeah, to plant and I have to work and my mom was thrown around. Yeah. Oh my God. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then that's the other thing too, when you're like, you're overwhelmed with like, theoretically, you probably have time to do both. But I'm also, again, one of those people where it's almost like a, like the one track mind of it all, where it's like the, pl my plan today was to do this. And it's almost like, I, I remember seeing this graphic and it was like about chill, it was about kids. And it was about how, you know, with kids who have like processing difficulties or have a difficult time with change, it was sort of this idea that there was, there's this kid, right? And they're invested in what they're doing. And as they're invested, like tendrils of intrigue and basically it was the way it was described was kind of like when you get stuck into something, you have these like tendrils of growth that grow out as you're working on something, right? Where it's like, you know, you're, you're getting, you're getting focus and intrigue and enjoyment and endorphins and whatever from that, right? And so all of these phalanges are coming out of your body because you're invested in a thing, right? And then someone goes, quick, now it's time to do something else. And you have to then, if you have a hard time with change or quick, you know, fast paced environments, you then have to take all those tendrils that you've expanded out into the universe while you are focusing on a task and bring them back in to then be able to focus and shift gears, right? It's almost like you have, like you're in a web. You're in a web of hyper-focus and like all of these strings, right? And all of these tendrils have, you know, I don't know, feelings and emotions and sensitivities and stuff attached to them and they're all spread out, right? And so if someone goes quick change a task, you then have to recoil all of those strands, right? But if somebody goes quick change a task, there's no time and you're yanked away from what you're doing, then all of those strands get broken or they get jumbled or they get, you know what I mean? Like that was what the visual was. It's basically this kid with the, like basically like growing life and intrigue and love, right? And then it was like quick change a task and they rip them away from that. So all of those tendrils break, right? And it can be very distressing because you've not had an adequate amount of time to decompress and refocus for what your next activity is. And so I find that that sometimes happens even when you're not doing the thing it's almost like okay i have a plan and so my brain and the way i'm moving and living my life is calibrated to the fact that i know i have this one thing that i'm doing after work today right and it's like yeah maybe there's you're seeing somebody for maybe four hours and there's like eight hours in the in the evening so you could theoretically do both but in your brain you've made a schedule of how your day is gonna go and so that schedule is almost like the same equivalent of those tendrils coming out and locking in to being like, I'm focused on the trajectory of the day. And it goes, okay, the trajectory has changed. And you're like, what the shit, you know? And your brain has to kind of be like, okay, wait, what, excuse me, really? And it can be difficult. So yeah, I don't, I don't blame you for that. Like it was something even as dumb of like, when I was back in Sudbury, when I was, um, working uh i worked at a breakfast program so i worked at a program and they did breakfast programs after school programs like different sorts of programs things like that it's it's the same company that ran the summer camps where i lost a kid in dynamic earth 
if you don't know. <laughs> it, you, you have to be there to know. But anyway, so I used to run a breakfast program. So I'd have to get up at like 5.30 in the morning to go serve breakfast. And then I would drive home and have a nap because I would have to go to class in the afternoon or in like the evening or whatever. And so I would get up and plan in my head about how I would go home to have a nap. And that was my plan. But every once in a while, someone would call in sick from working the after school programs. And I would get called and mean like, hey, would you mind covering for this after school program? They don't have anyone. And it wasn't even, I did not technically have plans. I had plans to have a nap. But just the mental toll, and sometimes, like, not being shitty, but, like, well, I guess being shitty, a lot of times I was like, no, I don't, I have plans. My plan was to nap, but I knew that that's what I needed to function. And so sometimes if I had a decent sleep and it wasn't too bad and they were really struggling and sometimes what'll happen is, like, they would call and I'd be like, listen, like, I don't really, like, literally I'd be like, I don't really want to, but if you cannot get anybody else, I, I'll see what I can do. So sometimes it would be like the last person be like, I'm really sorry, you're the last person I've called, can you please? And you go, okay. But it still takes like a mental switch in your brain. And I don't know, man, like people who can just go with the flow, like what's that like? <laughs> truly what is that like is anybody just like yeah okay cool like whatever it's fine you know like that i don't know kudos to you share your secrets tell me your ways because that no like i don't have and it's one of those things where like i can change the plan and the trajectory but you have to give me a minute to process that you know what i mean and I think that's the thing that can be difficult is it's not like I'm unaccommodating, but I also respect that sometimes there isn't time to sit down and wait for the plan to sink in. It just has to change and you have to react. But I don't know, like it just, I think that's the part that's difficult. Like it's not like I can't switch tasks or re figure out what the game plan is like okay we are going to do this instead and you go oh shit okay because sometimes it's not even just the task it's the expectation of like okay this is how i was expecting things to go so it's not even just changing the task it's changing like i don't know like your mental expectation and experience of a situation and sometimes that can be really difficult especially if like when the plan changes and you know even to like if the plan changes and you're looking forward to it you know what i mean where it's like oh we're gonna go do this thing damn i'm really looking forward to doing this thing and it's like oh no the plan changed because something something came up and it's like first of all the plan changed which is like oh shit that changed but then also if the change means you're not getting to do the thing you were looking forward to then that's like a different emotional situation as well but yeah i don't know man change is hard stuff is difficult and that's why i'm realizing now because there were so many like i don't know man like job interviews or when you look at jobs now my new thing is not that i've been in you know there's been a couple i've dipped my foot into the idea of going back to a quote-unquote traditional working environment um in certain experiences but i've not like fully sat down and really looked at um jobs and stuff but i know for a fact that if I'm looking at job advertisements and they say fast paced environment, I'm like, fuck right off. Absolutely not. Cause I know that that will mean firefighting and dropping things and constantly, you know, having to readjust your expectations and do more with less and whatever, whatever. And I'm like, I get that a lot of companies need to do that. But I'm like, if you tell me like, oh, you know, it's a real fast paced environment and you know, you got to be on your toes and do multiple things, you know, no, because that will like, and I know, and I'm like, like not being funny that I will do your company a disservice by being employed there because I will either not be able to do what you are asking of me or I will do it, but it will cause me such mental anguish that I will burn out. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I'm like, either way, we're going to have a bad time. So we probably, probably shouldn't do that. The office is not fast paced. Yeah. And that's the thing. And I think that's so funny. And I get there's a certain level of like, not wanting to be 
bored at your job like you want to sort of you want to have some value or feel like you know it needs to feel stimulating in some way and it can even like get busy at times you know what I mean like there's an understanding that there's certain moments that can be a bit stressful and whatever but when it's constant and when it's like oh my god like we have to do a million things with nothing like people can do that and I am that was the other issue I had with the field that I got educated in, right? The idea of like social work, youth work, social services, things like that. They always have to do more with less. They have to do so much with less. And I've experienced just a toe dip for a few years in those environments. And I know that I struggle. And especially too, when you're working with some of the most vulnerable populations, you cannot be going through shit because they are going through shit and you need to be there. Like obviously, you know, nobody's perfect. And I think therapists should also be able to have access to therapy and stuff like that. But you know what I mean? Like I can't be having a mental breakdown at work um, because there are children or youth or people that need like certain things, you know what I mean? And so, yeah, it just, and but there's people who can and they take everything in their stride. And honestly, I am so, in awe of them to be honest yeah like i'm just i'm so in awe of people who can be almost like i don't know man like the freedom fighters of the world who can do so much with so little and just like hunker down and i don't know maybe that's survival instincts and maybe you like it's one of those things where i have this thing where i'm like am i mentally ill or am I just a little bitch you know what I mean like it sounds really bad but I'm like sometimes I'm always like oh man like is this like and again that's that's another thing that I internalize and I have to work through and I've had to you know express or like give myself compassion that like I'm not weak for not being able to do these things um but there is that sort of yeah this or almost like inferiority complex that I'm like oh my god like I would love to not do that and then I'm like oh maybe everyone's going through stuff and they're just handling it better but then you can't do that right because then you get into this like blame game or have this like inferiority complex where like everybody's coping better than I am and like I'm a piece of shit because I don't know how to cope with this and whatever which is like not productive so it took me a long time to get over that because I think there was a lot of internalized like I don't know yeah, like just internalized like self-hatred about my inability to cope with stuff. And so I've had to work through that and understand that like, no, these are my limits. And luckily, you know, I also recognize that I'm in a very privileged position to not have to compromise on those because obviously there are people that are in the world who are like me, who are very sensitive and do need a lot of structure and boundaries and through you know, family circumstances, financial circumstances are unable to be in the environments where they can thrive successfully out of necessity. You know what I mean? Which really pisses me off and frustrates me that um, not everyone has that ability. So I do recognize that like that is something that I have a privilege of that I can be like, listen, I like basically, and this has been something that's been like an ethos in my family and a lot of times where it's like nothing is worth sacrificing your mental health over and I believe that wholeheartedly and I believe that if something is really causing you mental strife whether or not you even realize it or if it's manifesting itself in physical ways or whatever like Things shouldn't have to break you. You know what I mean? Like nothing, nothing is worth breaking your mental and physical self for. But I recognize that some people don't have the option to walk away from that because systems in are not in place to support people. Um... So I think, unfortunately, even though I would like everyone to be like, oh, is that causing, and I guess too, like there's, and I am aware, you know, like you have to, like there is a difference between 
this is a momentary stressful situation, you know, like I have deadlines or there's important meetings or there's, you know, things like that. But when it becomes a chronic thing and you're like, oh, I am not able to care for my physical well-being. I'm not able to enjoy my life because I am either constantly exhausted, mentally drained, physically, whatever, that I am missing out on the things that bring my life joy and value and happiness to deal with this bullshit, essentially. So I, yeah, I'm a firm believer that like, fuck those things. Um, yeah. And that's the thing, right? And I think even too, even if it's like, yeah, and that's hard. Like, and, it, and it's a thing, right? Where you're kind of like, okay, what does that look like, right? And it's okay, how do you how do you take time away and heal from that? But then, like you said, it's like, okay, do I take time off and I only have such a small amount of time off? And it seems really dumb to be like, okay, you get like, what, a week of holiday a year and I'm gonna take time off not to vacate, I guess to be fair, like vacationing can be a way to help with like, you know, burnout and whatever. But there's so many people that I know that take time off work just to like catch up on life. You know what I mean? I'm going to take a week off work just to like reset my house. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think that's fair too. And I don't know like if when you call in sick is that like, do you have a certain number of sick days or if that's considered like unpaid or stuff like that, right? Cause again, that is the thing where sometimes you don't have the option and you kind of, you either have to take the L, you have to, you know, take the loss or you have to, yeah. And so then, yeah, that becomes a thing. But as well, it's one of those where it's like, if it's unpaid, but you're in a position where you can afford that, then I would take that. You know what I mean? Like if it's like, if you're, if you're struggling so much that you can't commit. Yeah. Yeah. I would say, I think that that's valid truly. And honestly, like, I don't know, man, <laughs> maybe this is like the, like fuck society, damn the man perspective from me. But I'm like, Listen, if you need to take time off and you can afford to take the time off, call in sick. Fuck them. You know what I mean? Like they can manage. And if they can't manage, then they need to employ more people so they can manage without you. Um, because, yeah, like it just if it's something where the infrastructure is so broken that they can't survive with one person taking time to take care of themselves, then they need to restructure their entire company, to be honest. But I'm aware that's easier said than done. And you know, the capitalism and the money of it all makes that complicated, but you know. I'm basically, like, it sounds really, not shitty, but kind of funny. It's kind of like, I'm, to be fair, I would do the same way, but I'm kind of like the work equivalent of, you know, anytime you have those like memes online where a person will be like, yeah, my boyfriend blow and they go dump him, like dump him. You know what I mean? Like, that's just the baseline where it's like, yeah, but no, no, fuck him, dump him. No, bye bye la, like that. I'm like the job equivalent of that. I'm like, oh, your job is treating you like shit? Call in sick. Like, I understand that there are structural inequalities and you maybe can't afford to leave that position. But like, if they're treating you like shit, I'm like, take your full hour lunch break that you are technically, like, if you're entitled to it. Because the amount of people that I know that are like, yeah, I, I get a lunch break, but I never take it. I'm like, why? Take your lunch break. Take your lunch break. Call in sick if you can afford to do so, you know? Take that, you know, I don't know, take that extra long poop in the company bathroom to give yourself a few minutes alone on your phone, just like scrolling through TikToks and stuff. Do you know what I mean? I don't get one now, but I didn't take one. Yeah.
Really? You don't get one? You don't get a lunch break? What the fuck? Yeah. Yeah, and I guess, and I guess too, because that's the other thing as well, right? Is I also respect, because I also was really bad at that as well. Like I would have my half hour lunch break and I would definitely be doing work during that. Um, we work through our lunches. Yeah, that's the other toss up, right? Where it's especially if you're hourly contracted, there's ways that you can work around your schedule to make it easier for you. Do you know what I mean? So like, it's probably more beneficial to your, like if you do a cost benefit analysis of what your mental health gains from either taking a half hour lunch break versus leaving early on a Friday. And if leaving early is more beneficial for your mental health, then that is the, that's the toss up you make. You know what I mean? And I think that that's fine. I think that that makes sense. Cause I, again, I was one of those people who was really bad. Cause again, I had perfectionism, people pleasing issues, which I probably still do. Um, which again is one of the concerns I have about, um, re-entering a traditional working environment is yeah. If I had outstanding things to do, it was difficult to take a lunch break. Cause I, those things would just hang in the back of your brain. Right. Like, like even now, like I have this to-do list and even though I am aware that I will get these things done, obviously this is a very much lower stakes, but the fact that I've not gotten these boxes decoupaged and finished, even though I know that there should be enough time and it'll be okay, there's my anxiety baseline is higher than it would be if these were just completed. Do you know what I mean? And so even if, so sometimes it becomes difficult where it's like, if I just plow through this, then I don't have to worry about it anymore. That actually can be, well, I think it's an unsustainable way to potentially ease your anxiety, but it's a, it feels like if I can just hammer this out and get this done, then I will stop being stressed about this and I can eat later. You know what I mean? So my mental health, is, yeah, my mental health, exactly. And that's, that's the benefit. So that makes more sense. I don't usually have to work during lunch anyway. Yeah, I guess, you know, in the grand scheme of things, you get to hang out with me, so. <laughs> but yeah, no, it, it's difficult, definitely. And I, like, yeah, kudos to people who are going through it and still managing to show up and do their damn best every day, you know? So. Yeah. But yeah, so it, yeah, it's, it's a battle. It's difficult, but I'm rooting for all of you because I don't know, freaking, what is it? Living is hard. <laughs> it's hard. Out, it's hard out there, guys. We're all just out here trying our best. And isn't that the thing? Like the older you get, the more you realize, you know, Frick all. You're like, I don't know what's going on. And I'm just, you know, I don't know. We, we out here, we out here doing our best. That's all we can ask of ourselves. But I think obviously there's, I don't know, as much as I'm like, we're all trying our best. Like, I think there are possibly some people who could be doing better for themselves, but sometimes, and again, for other reasons, like it could be that you are not in a space where you can tackle those behaviors or those quirks in your life that maybe you need to work through either via therapy or via like different coping strategies and stuff like that. Um, Cause I do think that there are sometimes people who are like, oh, I'm doing my best. And I'm like, no, you're making everyone's life really difficult. Maybe you should have some introspection and work through some of that trauma instead of making it everyone else's problem. But, but again, it's hard. It's hard. You know, you don't want to, I don't know. I do find that that happens to me sometimes. Like I get, again, because I'm aware that I come from a privileged place where I am able to work through my bullshit, work through my mental health bullshit. And I am like in a position where I'm able to do that. Um, I have a hard time with people who are not self-aware or are not taking the time to be introspective of like 
I'm maybe being a shitty person or I'm maybe not handling this very well and it's impacting my relationships. Um, I should maybe work on that. Do you know what I mean? And it's like, again, it's like with anything, right? Like if you are doing things, oh yeah, honestly, that too. <laughs> Yeah, truly, truly. Really, I know, I love, they were like, yeah, apparently turd was not appropriate. I allowed, <laughs> I love that. Really, Maude, really? Yeah, I love that. Maybe because it thought that you were calling me a turd, but I know you were just talking about the scenario. <laughs> the mod isn't that self-aware. The mod didn't realize that you were telling a story and pretending to be someone. <laughs> but yeah, no, and that, that, again, that's the other thing too, where, and again, I don't know, like I just, maybe, maybe, yeah, people who like, exactly. Like it's just, it's frustrating when I'm like, are you're just not compassionate and understanding of people. Or it, like, it's that with a combination of like the blame game, where I'm like, I have no empathy for other people, but I have been wronged and it's everyone else's fault. As opposed to like, you know what I mean? It's this weird thing where it's like, I don't understand and don't give a shit about anyone, but everybody needs to understand that I am a victim here and I'm gonna make my maladaptive coping strategies your problem. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like, oh, you're being triggered right now. Um, and that's causing you to lash out at me and now it's my problem. No, no, I'm not, no. You go and take the time to do that. But I don't know. It's this weird thing. Cause then I wonder too, right? Like, I don't know. With people, like you said, like people who are not self-aware, like the people who stand in the middle of the aisle and are oblivious to their physical space as well as like their emotions. I assume that they're sort of ostriching head in the sand and they're not actually happy. But maybe ignorance is bliss. I don't know. I am very intrigued by that. Like that is something that I find really fascinating where I'm like, you're so head in the sand about everything. And that, I don't know. And it's like making every, like making your inability to process what's going on with you, everyone else's problem and unwilling to try to explore and come to terms and change that. But like, are you happy with that? I don't, I don't know. You know what I mean? Like, I just, that's interesting. Like to be so like, that's the thing that I always find really interesting with people who are like, well, that's just the way I am. And I'm like, oh, okay. So have you given up? Are you like, have you been defeated? by your own psyche? Are you like, wow, I'm a piece of shit. I just might as well continue to be one. I'm like, that sucks, man. People can change. Everyone has the ability to grow. Why do you think you can't? Why? Like, I just, you know, that that's actually, it's more heartbreaking than anything. And I get, you know, it probably comes out of a fear. Like, the, you know, I think most things come from places of most, I don't know, like most negative, emotions or negative reactions probably could be distilled as coming from a place of fear i think it's like you know fear of rejection fear of loneliness fear of i don't know incompetence like just that you know fear of not being good enough or whatever and then it's kind of like oh if i'm angry at the world then I can never be hurt by the world. And that is very, that seems, that's like a fear-based reaction to things. But sometimes people's fear can manifest itself in like anger. And when that anger gets directed at other people, like that's, and that's basically, it's one of those where I'm like, if you want to be set in your ways and be unhappy and live your life, whatever, that's fine. It's a kind of my same approach with people who like, um, in, like 
take drugs, people who use drugs, people who, you know, drink a lot of alcohol, all that kind of stuff, right? Like, so people who have different coping mechanisms or engage in activities that are maybe considered taboo or inappropriate or even illegal, my mentality is if, you know, whoever's involved is a consenting adult and your behaviors and activities are not detrimentally impacting the people around you, then do whatever you want. You know what I mean? Like self-implode, that's fine. Not that everyone who does taboo things are self-imploding, but I think like sometimes if like, and I guess to be fair, if people are doing things like, you know, using hard drugs, I would assume that at a certain point, yeah, at a certain point, potentially, it could negatively impact your relationships um, and your, you know, your sense of self or whatever. And then that would then become a problem, right? But if you are somebody who's engaging in some sort of activity, and again, you're able to function whatever functioning in society, in the world means to you, and you're able to have genuine relationships with people that you care about, then do whatever you want. The problem is when your behaviors or your, the way that you deal with conflict, trauma, um, the way that you handle interpersonal relationship conflict, things like that, if your behaviors are then negatively impacting the people that are around you and the people that are close to you, even people who aren't, people who aren't close to you. Like if you're lashing out at strangers, um, that's not okay. You know what I mean? I'm like, if everybody's out to get you and you are just angry at everyone and people you don't even know, that's not okay. You know, people don't deserve that. Random strangers don't deserve that. Family members don't deserve that, truthfully. Like, I, I am one of those people where I'm like, I don't, like, there's a certain line. Like, I get there's certain positions, but it does get to a point where I'm like, I do not care if you are someone who, like, if you are family or you are somebody that I care about and love and you are being disrespectful, whether that's being angry, whether that's name calling, whether that's lashing out, you know, I can empathize that you're doing this from a place of fear, from a place of unhappiness, but I don't have to accept that that's how you're dealing with it. Do you know what I mean? Or I'm like, okay, um, you are struggling. Cool. I'm not going to tolerate name calling. You know what I mean? I'm just not. So even if, you know, it's something you didn't mean, it's something, you know, it was a reaction to whatever, I'm like, cool, I'm going to now set a boundary that you do not do this again to me. Um, but yeah, it's, it, and it's hard, I get it, but I do think that there's a difference between being like, I understand that you are hurting and where you are coming from, but you need to understand that the way you are treating me based on how you are feeling is not acceptable. Um, but yeah, yeah, a lot of people in the office, yeah. What a strange concept, eh? Everyone is out to get them. And you go, well, why? And then they go, it's the woke people. And I'm like, in what way? And also not being funny. If you think that someone is out to get you, especially if it's like the left, you know, is out to get you. Not being funny, you probably deserve to get got. <laughs> Not being funny, I'm like, mm, do you have some skeletons in your closet that you would like to, you know? I'm like, are you advertising that you are a piece of shit? Or, you know what I mean? I don't think you're probably leaving soon. Yeah. You should order, like, I know you won't, but it's like, you should order, like, the bougiest thing on the menu. Just for funsies. But if it's gonna be gross, then maybe. Yeah, that's true. That is true, and that's so funny, because the whole thing is it's like, you don't want to draw attention to the skeletons in your closet, but the fact that you're screaming about how attacked you are, I'm like, seems pretty sus. Seems a little sus, you know? But, yeah. I don't know, people are funny, aren't they? What's going on? 
the phones the phones are doing the things I am, um, I, well, actually, let me see. I, uh, my family has this, not this like unspoken thing, but basically I found a um, gluten-free like mac and cheese, like one of those like frozen dinner microwavable things because my family, we have this like long history of my brother like loves craft dinner. Like he grew up on craft dinner. He was always, and it was one of those things where he would make bougie craft dinner where he'd do a craft dinner, but then add spices and all this stuff and like herbs and whatever, and then eat it straight out of the pot. And so a few weeks ago, my mom was like, oh, I have some gluten-free ones, like a gluten-free pot, and I'm going to eat it right out of the pot, just like Vic. And it's like this whole, I don't know, it's like a comfort food, family bonding thing. So I found some, not of the like box variety, like the KD box variety, but just like a frozen one that you would then heat up in the microwave. So it wasn't as nostalgic, but it still tasted pretty good. So my, my family's just re responding. Um, their, their seal of nostalgic KD approval. So that was nice. <laughs> they were like, it looks good. I'm like, perfect. I got, I got, the, I got the, the seal of approval in that respect. Have I finished all the edges of this? Yes. Okay, so now it's time. So now we're gonna have three edges on the go. I was gonna say edge lords, but I feel like that's not something I should say. I don't even know what that is. You know how people like sometimes say things like, oh, so-and-so's a this. I'm like, what even does that mean? Let's look it up. Now I'm concerned. I'm, maybe I shouldn't Google it. I'm sure Urban Dictionary will tell me, but like I've seen people use the term edge lord, and I don't actually know what it means. What's an edge lord? Edge lord memeing. Oh, I see. I see. You know what edging is? <laughs> is that because of your hockey novel? <laughs> okay, an edge lord is a person who affects a provocative or extreme persona, especially online. Typically used of a man. Oh, okay, so an edge lord is just like a piece of shit troll. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. For like the purpose of like shocking and offending. All right. I feel like that's what I assumed it was. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> and you're like, perhaps. No, I don't know, man. I'm trying to think. Maybe, maybe there is, I was going to say, there's no edging in hockey. There is icing. There is icing in hockey. I don't know if there's edging in hockey. <laughs> All right, okay, now we're gonna move on to the last box. In terms of like putting the, the covering the perimeters, um, and then we'll go from there. But yeah, I'm trying to maximize my perimeter edges. <laughs> there was, that's so funny. I love it. I wonder if my mom's, cause I told you guys how my, like my mom would read, we would call them half books which are like, you know, the Harlequin romance ones. But I think the ones that she would like always pick up from what I understood, like in terms of the, like the, the covers, they always looked like the things really, um, it, they were more like historical romance ones, um, in that respect. Cause they always had like, like, uh, flowy dresses and like corsets and billowing bosoms like I don't think they they were never looking very modern or the most modern they would get is they would be like cowboy ones you know what I mean so they would be like ranch men that would be sort of like the closest equivalent to like a more modern version at least like from from the looks of the covers I don't actually know I don't think there was any like corporate businessman looking ones and stuff like that Oh man, I used to read some back in the day. Oh, Highlander, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh really, Girls Fall Back in, oh interesting. Like time travel -y sort of ones. That's kind of cool. I do think that that's really interesting. And I don't know, I feel like I might have read like an article or something, but if not, I feel like it's an under-researched area of literature where like, 
romance novels or like smutty novels sort of transcend literary genres. You know what I mean? Where it's like you can have a fantasy romance novel. You can have a historical romance novel. You can have a sci-fi romance novel. You can have a teen romance novel. You can have like, I don't know, like a, yeah, like a YA romance novel. It sort of is a bit transcendent of genres. Oh yeah, Alien Royale, yeah. That's what I mean. Like it's, it's very interesting. And I feel like it's, they're quick. To, like I think sometimes, I don't know how well all of them get written, but I do think there's a certain level of like, literary credit that is due that you can basically kind of double tap into two different genres and if you can do it well then that's amazing yeah i think i don't know i've never been like in general I think like I read a lot of YA novels, like I read a lot of novels growing up, like, you know, your YA sort of series and stuff like that. And so obviously there were elements of romance in them because most YA novels have that, unless you're reading the fantasy ones, but I didn't. I read more like contemporary slice of life stuff with your like occasional supernatural element. Um, but yeah, as I got older, like I was never like, I'm not a big romance movie person. I'm not a big romance book person. I don't even know. Again, I have, I've talked about this before where like I have niche interests. So it'll be like, oh, there was this thing I watched that was kind of cool. And then it would be like, the, then I would get recommended things similar to that. And none of them would be the same. It's like the thing that connected all of them to make them similar was not the thing that I was engaging in that content for. So I don't know. I feel like I'm very hit and miss with stuff. I was doing this the other day where, I, again, I was scrolling through. I scrolled through the Netflix and the Prime and the Disney Plus and was like, what do I watch? And I came up blank. And I think that's why I ended up, I've ended up today. I think I was going to say this, but I forgot or I got distracted. Is aside from, you know, snooping on the neighbors and going for, for shadow walkies. I've recently binged like three episodes of Christy Carlson Romano's Vulnerable podcast on YouTube. Obviously there's an audio version, but I was watching the, the, the video versions on YouTube because obviously I've watched, I don't know, a couple of, you know, I, I dive back and forth into my like decom Nickelodeon 2000s think piece stuff. Um, and so I was watching specific episodes. So Christy Carlson Romano played Ren Stevens on Even Stevens. And so she has a podcast. And so there was a, few, a bunch of episodes where she was talking about talking to other child actors and ones of interest and stuff like that. And so I went down a bit of a rabbit hole. And so I have a renewed interest in the children's mental health side of um, what you call it of child acting. Yeah. My all-time favorite series by Anne McAfee and it's the Tower. Okay. Interesting. Slice of life. Wrong. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it was really interesting. I, cause I've watched and engaged in content with like Alison Stoner before. And the one that was interesting was obviously, cause a lot of things now, I don't know if you guys have watched them. I've not started watching any of them. But a few um, people now have started doing rewatch podcasts. So stars of these shows have started doing um, rewatch podcasts of their shows and then providing background and commentary and stuff on that, right? Yeah, no, I didn't really, it's like bits and pieces, but I think she's really gone on a journey. I think a lot of them have. Um, and again, it's been really interesting listening to their them talking because they're trying to um, get like support put in place in the industry for young actors. And I think in doing so, like there's this thing where people like to, yeah. <laughs> Hi, Rebecca. Hello, hello. How 
are you today? I hope you're having a fabulous day. Um, but yeah, I think the thing that's interesting to me is because as much there's this like fine line of like not wanting to be another sensationalized statistic and talking about the abuse and the struggles that they went through as teen stars but then also understanding that in order to justify the industries putting in protections for child actors and young people over time um there needs to be enough data to show that there is a legitimate need for these things to be put in place and so it's quite interesting hearing them talk about that. And I was thinking about that because that's something that I think, I don't know. I don't know if anybody is, but every once in a while, um, <laughs> they do be. <laughs> that's amazing. Yay. I'm glad. I'm glad you're having an excellent day so far. Um, but yeah, so. I just find that really interesting. And I guess because one of the things that I, the only thing I really enjoyed about, not the only thing, but one of the main things I ended up enjoying the most about like going through school, like getting degrees in like social work and stuff like that was the research element of it. And the idea of like, you have to do qualitative and quantitative research in order to justify grant applications in order to justify policy changes and things like that, right? And so every once in a while, my mom always jokes like, oh, maybe we should go and get our PhDs in something. She wants to do it on um, elder care, <laughs> specifically like elder care in, and the cross section of like dementia and hoarding tendencies because we have some personal experience with family members doing that. But again, because I have a nostalgic pop culture love of it all, wouldn't it be insane to do like to go into research and to get a doctorate in like understanding the intricacies of child stardom. I think that would be really interesting. And then, you know, it would be cool to get to again. And then because, you know, I'm also a stan, it would be interesting to like learn and work because I wonder because it sounds like people are trying to find people to do that. And so I feel like a lot of child stars, maybe, I don't know if in the UK, but I feel like a lot of kids, like child stars are getting to the point where they want to open up and talk about the bullshit. And so I think there's probably a market for that. But back as you want to join the discord, let me send you that link. But yeah. So anyway, so I watched her interview Alison Stoner. I watched her interview um, the four, the three cast members from Ned's Declassified School Survival Guide because they started a rewatch podcast. Jennifer Stone and, um, oh, what's his name? I think it's Dave DeLuise. The Harper and the dad from Wizards of Waverly Place. They've started a rewatch podcast. I'm intrigued about watching some of those. Just because it's in, because then it, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. It's sort of like you peel back the curtain a little bit. And, but again, I think I've already consumed a lot of that content, so I don't think anything would surprise me anymore. I I don't know. I kind of like the insider baseball of it all. Uh, did I invite you to that? Yes, I did. Cool, cool. I've just whispered that to you, Probacus. Feel free to join. But yeah, so we'll see. So basically, I've been watching her podcast, and she's been interviewing people who all have their own podcasts. Um, I've not watched their podcasts yet, but it's interesting. I did, the other one too, because I think we've talked about it before, is um, Alexa Nichols from Zoe 101 and about her experience and all the work that she's doing. And that's fascinating to me. I know it's like, you know, triggering and painful, similar to when I like engaged in Jeanette McCurdy's book. And I was like, wow, this is a lot. And I'm a little bit needing to decompress from reading that. Um, but it was amazing. But yeah, that kind of stuff. And so, yeah, I don't know. I, every once in a while I go through these phases where it's like nostalgia, but like, I don't know. It's almost like a more nuanced take on nostalgia. Cause as much as I love just, you know, watching a decom and talking about the good old days and whatever, I also find it so interesting to hear the real perspective and how the, again, the juxtaposition and the sort of like oxymoron of the fact that there's children's shows that we grew up with that are so beloved and are so um 
like fill us with such warm fond memories and then to find out that the stars of these shows maybe did not have the same warm fun memories that you the consumer had about that content is very interesting to me and it's interesting to try to reckon with like things that you love like I know people like I was never I was a bit older when like the iCarly came out I still watched it I wasn't like a super stan for it or anything but I find it so interesting that people who grew up with the show, who are absolutely obsessed, who love it, who are like, oh my God, this show raised me, these characters raised me. And then to find out that Janet McCurdy is like, no, I actually fucking hated that character. And they really fed into a lot of trauma that I was like not, you know, working on at the time. It's like, oh wow, damn, like both can happen at once. And that's the thing that I find the most interesting when like, I don't know, I think, as much as I know I struggle sometimes with my black and white thinking as an anxiety, maladaptive thinking pattern, um, you know, the black and white thinking of it all, the gray sort of, yeah, the, the oxymoron of life where two seemingly opposite things can exist at the same time is quite interesting to me. So I like, pursuing consuming stuff that explores those things in in ways that again i have a tie to right so in the context of like nostalgia and like child stars and the disney channel and stuff like that right because i do think the part that i struggle with in terms of that like duality is with things like politics or things like medicine and stuff like that like those are things that i can't stomach the potential duality of that I find it really difficult I find like it it instantly like gets my hairs prickling and stuff like that so there's certain things that I can't really I struggle with engaging in both sides of the discussion of certain topics um but with that one I find it very interesting makes you sound like back at the shows I watched yeah exactly exactly and some of them, to be fair, some of them weren't. So there's, again, it was really interesting talking to, like listening to them talk to the Ned's Declassified cast because they were a Nickelodeon show, but they weren't a Dan Snyder show. Um, and they talk very warmly about her, their experiences. And so I do think that, you know, it's not, they talk very warmly about their experiences on the shows. And, but the thing that's interesting, and I do think what it sounds like what Allison Stoner is trying to navigate and discuss is even though they were not actively being abused on the sets of their shows, when the height of their fame ended, when they were like, what, 17, 18, that still is a very psychologically traumatic thing to have to work through to have to be like, okay, I am a celebrity, I am beloved, I'm on top of the world, like nothing can touch me, to then be like, oh, I have to go out and try to be a normal human is a bit of a psychological minefield to have to navigate, right? Especially if, like, because I would even seem to, to be fair, to a lesser degree, I feel like I kind of experienced that a little bit. Um... In, in a little bit of a lesser degree, because I remember kind of grappling with this, where I, I grew up singing a lot. Like, so I, in my like local school, like in my school and stuff like that, like that was my thing. I was on talent shows every year and I did all this kind of stuff. And I was always praised for that. And it was something like, and I definitely got a really big like, dopamine high I guess I don't know if it's an endorphin rush an endorphin rush for being praised and being applauded for being good at this thing right and obviously when I was in school um there were all these opportunities to do this right and it wasn't like I had to write music or do anything I could just sing and everyone was like oh my god this is amazing she's amazing this is great and of course so that really fueled my ego and I was like damn like I love this and then I stopped performing because I went to university. I started doing other things. Like it wasn't something that then got pursued. And I was like, shit, I'm not getting external validation for being good at a thing anymore. 
And then I was kind of like, I don't know, I feel like, I don't know, like it wasn't in a, in a way that was like super destructive, but the concept of like needing to seek out external validation and have people tell me, oh, you're amazing. This is really great. Like you're so awesome. I felt like I needed that because when that went away, it was like shit. And I don't know. And again, it, it's not like it was anyone's fault. It wasn't like it was a bad thing. Like I wasn't, you know, I'm not gonna turn around and be like, don't praise your children for being good at stuff. But I don't know if I was ever taught to like learn how to internally validate myself. Do you know what I mean? Like I tied my identity and who and what I was like, what I was good at then became my value. And so when I stopped getting external praise for the things I was good at, similar to be fair, similar thing happened like in university, right? Like in school, when if you have good grades and you're being, you know, praised for being smart or whatever, and you're getting good grades and stuff like that, that is again, another endorphin dump external validation. Look at me, I got 80% on this paper. Look at me, I did this thing. And then when you become an adult, like, and to be fair, I think this is just a thing. Like when you go through school, I guess I've, I've seen a lot of stuff online of like, you know, former gift or, gifted kids getting burnt out um, when they become adults. And I think they're, again, it's a smaller scale version of I think what happens to child stars where you're constantly like being told, oh my God, this is amazing. You're amazing. A plus gold star. This is incredible. And then you get into the real world and like you don't get gold stars for shit. You know what I mean? Like people don't, I don't know. Like it just seems like praise doesn't come as frequently and if it does it sometimes is at a cost because again that's sort of like in feeling or, or tying your self-worth to um what you're good at and so then wanting to be, you know, and then again, that then is what causes the perfectionism and the people pleasing is it's like, if I do really good at this, people will praise me and tell me I'm amazing and that will give me my endorphin dump and then let me feel validated. And so I can never fail or be bad at something because then I'm not going to get that and then I'm going to feel like shit about myself. Um, but yeah, so that that's an, it's an interesting thing. And so then it's this weird, it's this interesting so basically there was a there was a time um where i was sort of going through it and understanding and breaking down all of this and realizing like oh wow okay did i actually enjoy singing or did i like being praised for it and i've now realized now i have a bit of a healthier outlook of it and i do actually love it and it's not for the validation it's something that makes me feel good to do but I had to sit there and question that and sit in that for a little bit um, and real, yeah, I don't know, just like go through that and have that conversation with myself. And so I do think that it is similar in the child um, acting space where you're constantly praised and you're constantly like overachieving because you have to learn lines and you have to be on time and you have to basically be a tiny adult and everyone's telling you how great and mature and wonderful you are. And then when your show ends and that stops, you're like, well, I, that, that's the only way that I know that I'm, a, that I'm a good person, that I have value and I'm worth something. So let me go seek that out elsewhere. And so sometimes you seek that out in good ways i guess and then other ways you seek that out in not good ways and so that's why a lot of people ended up you know turning to get that high elsewhere whether it be with drugs whether it be with you know abusive partners who like love bombed you and told you you were amazing and all this kind of stuff and then yeah i don't know it's just it's interesting and i do think that there is lower levels of that um that i think need to yeah could be unpacked and could be useful for the average person not just the the child star of it all you know what i mean i don't know if i ever cared about validation because i never got much of it oh interesting mm -hmm. yeah 
Yeah, I guess, it, like, and that's the thing that's really interesting, right? Is because you're kind of like, it seems like a non, it seems like obviously you should praise, you should, you know, be excited and you know, happy and celebratory when kids do stuff and they are successful in them. I think, you know, I think in general, people should celebrate their wins and like celebrate their highs and stuff. But yeah, there's this then weird thing where it's almost like if you don't get that, like if you don't get that in that endorphin dump, then you don't crave that endorphin dump. So then if that endorphin dump goes away, you don't then need to seek it out in different ways, which is interesting because in, in one breath, I would say that's so terrible that no one ever validated you as a kid. Like to me, that sounds, that sounds heartbreaking, right? But then as an adult, that's not something that you actively seek out to try to fill that void because you, you know what I mean? So it's, it's this weird thing where I'm like, you know, maybe too much praise is not good. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. So if you were satisfied in that respect, then yeah, that sounds almost like the healthier thing. Though I guess there is a joke sometimes where, you know, when you, when you meet entitled assholes, isn't there like there's a sort of a saying of like you know your mom told you you were special too many times do you know what i mean you hear rumbles me like here or on the because i think i don't know there's probably like papers and stuff rolling around here if it was here you heard rumbles probably yeah yeah It's interesting. Oh, it's here. They're getting. Oh no! Go and eat your twenty dollar salad. You're like things are happening. It's happening. I'm sorry. I did not intend to um deep dive so much into the feels today <laughs> yeah oh no problem oh that's really sweet of you i hope lunch goes well i hope you have a nice time and if you don't have a nice time at least you have a good meal <laughs> that's all i can ask that's all we can ask of you and thank you for feeding pando I feel like Pando's about to evolve. I feel like he's getting close. Is he gonna level up soon? Yeah, he's pretty, pretty ding dang close. Okay. I think actually, it might be time for a snack break in a minute. Where did the pooch go? Oh, he's over there. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. I'll see you tomorrow. Have an amazing evening. You're the best. Enjoy your salad or whatever else. Get get the bougie flatbread. I don't know, man. I'm excited for you. I'm excited. Have an amazing rest of your day. Okay. Yes. Snack break soon. But yeah. I don't know, man. I didn't expect to get in the fields, but I guess I have been... Con I've been stressed dash anxious about stuff um and then consuming mental health related teen nostalgia content so i guess we're just you know i'm just in in my feels and feeling a bit reflective about the mental health of it all so yeah <laughs> It's been a wild one. It's been, it's been, it's been a wild couple hours. All right. Let's move on down. I'm not hurt anything. I'm excited. I'm excited to meet the new neighbors. I hope they're nice. I'm sure they're nice, but you know, I think it's less so like, cause I think there's a difference between being, I, well, I don't know. Is there a difference between being nice and being considerate? Cause I think people can be nice, but they can like, 
like pleasant and cordial, but not necessarily be considerate. You know what I mean? Um, I think I keep touching the side of this and then it's making my, this, this brush isn't long enough. It keeps getting, I need to start tilting this anyway. Um, but yeah, we're like, cause again, you know, I think we can have pleasant conversations with people and people can be nice to talk to, but there's like a different, again, I guess maybe it comes down to self-awareness. You can be a nice person, but not necessarily be self-aware. Um, so like, yeah, just like the, the consideration of others, um, in the way you conduct yourself. Which, you know, can be exhausting when you're constantly worrying about what other people, but something, again, something as simple as like, we have an alleyway in our, like we have an alleyway in our backyard where cars are coming and going. And so it's like, you know, making sure if people are visiting, they don't park in a way that disrupts the flow of the alleyway and stuff like that, right? So just things like that, where you just, you know, that's, that's what you want from, from a neighbor is you want their, I don't know. It's like, it's this thing where you want their comings and goings. I think especially because in the UK, not everywhere, but obviously in this situation, we have semi-detached houses and the, the space between you and your neighbor is quite tight. Whereas obviously where I grew up, like you could, you would still want to be cordial, but like you didn't feel like you were in someone's backyard. Like they would be hanging out and that you would have a perimeter Whereas it's like, I fully take like, you know, a few steps and I'm like, I'm in your yard. You know what I mean? So it needs to sort of be a little bit more cordial uh, in order to not be a painful experience to live next to somebody. Um, and it could, you know, and again, it's one of those, cause again, like if they're outside in their yard, um, I then, because we like, I think that the, the biggest, not the biggest issue, but one of the things is that because we're on a hill um, and the way our particular backyard is sort of like tiered, we can fully see into our neighbor's yard because our balcony can see over their fence panels. Whereas there's other places like my, my in-laws, they have like both sides of their houses, like the houses that they live on have like six foot tall fence panels. So you can't, you can hear neighbors outside, but you can't see them. So it feels more private and it feels less invasive into somebody else's yard or into somebody else's property, right? But ours isn't the case. Like we can fully see when our neighbors are outside. Um, and so sometimes it feels a bit like awkward if maybe they're having like a genuine moment outside and then we're also trying to be outside, it can almost kind of feel like you're interrupt, like you're almost like at a party you weren't invited to a little bit, even though there is like a wall, it doesn't necessarily feel like, cause you can physically make eye contact. You know what I mean? So like, especially like, so today for instance, less so, but obviously I took Shadow for a walk outside today and they were, you know, moving their stuff. And I, it's like, it's like, you don't want to maintain eye contact. You could, I guess, if you wanted to like have a conversation, but you almost like don't want to catch someone's eye. Cause you don't want to be seen as like being nosy or you don't want to like, I don't know. It just is this like interesting privacy dance you try to do with people just to make sure that they don't feel like you're like creeping on them, but also not being like rude and standoffish. And I don't know if I've particularly mastered that. Um, I think, well, I've talked about before how I'm, you know, I kind of have like a resting bitch face anyway. So I don't want to accidentally be in like resting bitch face mode when I take shadow for a walk in the morning. Cause I'm not awake yet. And then make eye contact and look like a grump. You know what I mean? So yeah. So it, it's, but again, maybe this is just my own personal insecurity and I just need to like stop giving a shit about that kind of stuff. Um, and I think that that comes with time. Like our, our neighbor on the other side, he's like an elderly man. Um, I do, do feel awkward one time. I was like in a rough space mentally and I was like swearing at the trash bin because it wasn't cooperating when I tried to open it. And like he peeked his head around the corner to like check if I was okay. Cause I was like, I was like cursing out the rubbish bin. Um, and so that was a bit awkward and embarrassing. Cause I was like, I kind of don't want you to see me when I'm having a mental health moment. 
<laughs> um, but for the most part, like, he's super chill, and we're just kind of like, oh, hey, like, how's it going? How's life? You know what I mean? Like, he's a really, you know, genuine, seems like a decent person. So, but it's still, it's still awkward sometimes. <laughs> Cause he's the same way. So he was out on his front porch and I was out on my front porch being like, oh, hey, what's up? How's it going? I think both of us kind of wanted to goss about the, the move that was happening, but I think it was like an unspoken, like, mm hmm, this is, this is happening. We are correct. But yeah, I don't know. So that's interesting. I don't know if anyone else has this problem where you like literally share sky space <laughs> with, with your neighbors. And so it's this delicate balance of like, we're, and like, obviously, I don't know, like when you get into the thick of the gar like into the garden, it sort of layers out. So it's only really like our patios and things where we can sort of see into each other's business. Um, but you still, I don't know, it's, yeah, it's different. So we'll see. I'm like low key hoping, like it sounds really shitty, but, it, and again, maybe, again, they're probably lovely and it's fine, but obviously one of the things that we talked, like the neighbors talked about before, they never ended up changing it. But Shadow's really tall, um, two-year-old lurcher dog Shadow. So their fence panels are not six feet tall. And so Shadow can actually jump up on his hind legs and put his front paws on the fence panel and like poke his head over and say hi. This is only on one, because again, like I said, we have a tiered garden. So we have this like patio that walks down to a larger patio area that then walks down a bit further. So when you're all the way on like the actual grass of the garden, you can't see, like, Shadow can't get over the fence panels, right? Like, you can still see heads. It's kind of like, what is it, in Home Improvement, where, like, his neighbor, you could always see, like, him from the eye up, but, like, from the head up. Like, we can see full, they're just a d detached heads walking around <laughs> in the in the neighbor yard. And so, so one of the things that I think the neighbors was really thinking about was they're like, oh, shit, like, this dog's popping over and saying hi to make it more private will get taller fence panels. They never ended up doing that, but I wonder if if the new neighbor is not too keen. We don't know. We don't know. Maybe she loves dogs. Maybe she's gonna be like, oh my God, Shadow's my bestie. You can pop over and say hi whenever you want. Who knows? But part of me also kind of want like thinks it would be nice if they then decided that they wanted to change all the fence panels and make them really tall. Cause I would respect that. It's not like as a way, like not in a way for me to not like, I don't, like, not in a way for me to be bitchy and unneighborly. Like, I never want to see these people. But I just think it is awkward if you're trying to enjoy your balcony. Especially, like, the neighbors, they would all sit and, like, sunbathe on their balcony. And then, like, me and Shadow are walking in out of the yard. And I have to turn to face their yard to get out of my house. Because that's the way the steps go. So, if you're on the balcony, I'm gonna see you. And that could be awkward. You know what I mean? I don't know. So, we'll see. But... It'll be interesting. And so again, it's, it's just a new thing. It's a new thing and I'm not like anxious about it. It's just interesting, right? Like it's a change. It's a change in the world in, in, my, in my personal zeitgeist. And so with new changes come intrigue and, you know, theories and, you know, curiosity and stuff like that. It's almost like it's the equivalent of when you're in elementary school and you've gone to school years and years with the same group of kids and then a new kid transfers to your school in like the sixth grade or the seventh grade or really any grade like so I've you know basically grown up with the same 30 kids multiple years and it's like so it's almost it's like oh my god this most intriguing creature has just come in and disrupted the normalcy or the like humdrum whatever of of the grade you know what I mean? Like there's a, there's almost like this air of like exoticism of like the new kid that's transferred over. What are they like? What's going on? Where did they come from? And that's, it's the, this is the adult version of that, I think. I think this is the adult version of that. So, yeah. Okay. The only problem I find with this glue is that as it gets down in the bristles, it then kind of dries and gets crusty. So I almost like, I don't know, I have to go in for like water, water breaks. That's why I have multiple brushes. Cause then this one can sort of like degunk itself and we can still continue working. In fact, I'll probably do that now. We'll stick this in there. Let's take a mini break. Let's take a snack break. Let's pop this in the water. Let's just close this for a second. 
Okay, so we now have three partially covered boxes, which is fine. <laughs> it's fine. It would be nice to get one fully covered by the end of stream, but I know, again, I'm probably not doing this the most efficient way because I'm trying to take advantage of the edge pieces going along the edges of the perimeters of the boxes. If I wanted to just like bang out one box, I should just be like using a whole sheet of paper to just cover one at a time. So I'm aware it's probably not the most efficient way to do things. So we might not completely finish one of the boxes, but it's still progress, you know what I mean? It's still happening. We are planning to take a break from this tomorrow. So tomorrow's stream, we're actually gonna cross stitch for the first time in a little bit. Um, yeah, cause I've not touched any cross stitches in a while. And I feel like it would be nice to stick a dent in one of those, one of the ever growing whip pile. Just also give me a break from this. And I don't know. I think I also get concerned about projects that are very repetitive um that can get kind of boring content wise so we're gonna switch it up tomorrow and by switch it up i mean basically return to basics this is a bit minutes we can crush it i have faith in us guys we'll keep going we'll get down to business what's going on here okay yeah we're definitely it's good though because i've again i've had this decoupage glue and stuff for so long and I don't know, I guess as long as glue is sealed, I feel like it probably doesn't expire. Like it doesn't dry out and stuff. It is looking like there's parts of this that are kind of chonky. So I do think that it, some of it has solidified. Um, but maybe it does happen. Maybe glue does like go off after a certain amount of time. Um, but so that being said, it would be helpful to put a decent dent into this if, cause again, I've had it for, I want to say a few, probably at least two years I've had this decoupage glue because it's whenever I got it to like decoupage some frames and stuff. Um, so that was at least, at least two years ago, if not longer. So we're putting a decent dent in it, luckily. Nope, that overhang. No! Listen, there we go. There we go. Okay. I'm at the point now too, I kept telling you guys how I wanted to paint my nails and do all that kind of stuff. And I guess, well, the concern is, cause part of me is like, I might as well just leave them until I have to paint them for the reception. So I don't have to worry about it. But sometimes the problem is if they get too long and they're unpainted, then they can be prone to breaking. The I find that like the nail polish helps have like a layer of protection from that. I guess the other option too is I could like bump up my nail oil routine. Cause apparently if you use like a bunch of nail oil that can also help build up the um 
resistance to breakage. Because there's always, it's my middle finger. This one always breaks. I'm not giving you guys the finger. I'm just pointing out this finger, the middle finger here, always tends to, I think because it's like usually when I'm cleaning or when I'm doing something and I end up accidentally like smacking it against like a corner of a wall or whatever. That's usually what happens. Do you know what I mean? Like it's a very specific niche thing when you're like cleaning a countertop and you're cleaning the countertop and you're trying to get in the corner and you just hit your fingers in a way that butts up between the wall and the countertop. And that's when I break the nails usually. Um, so I, to be fair, I need to, you know, the, the other thing is just be careful when I'm cleaning the countertop, but like sometimes you forget and you're just like in a hurry and you're like, oh, whatever, I'll wipe this down. I won't worry about it. Um, I, I do think I probably, I don't know. I don't think I have the best depth perception just in general. So that's maybe part of the problem is I'm mis gauging how, you know, how much room I have between. But the other thing too, is you're trying to get into the corners. Like you're strategically trying to get into the corners. And with that, you know, comes the potential for getting too into the corner. But we'll see. I might, I don't know, we'll see. We shall see. Maybe next week. Maybe, yeah, I don't know. The other, cause the other thing too, actually, the other thing too is I want to do a baking stream next week and I get concerned when I paint my nails and they get to a point where they're chipping. I don't want them to accidentally chip off in the baking and the baked goods. That wouldn't be ideal. So that's another thing that is also putting me off of painting them. But again, we then increase risk for breakage. And then I'll have a bunch of wonky sized nails for the reception. But I don't know, like it's this, it's this weird thing where like normal quote unquote, like it's usually like a female gendered thing. Um, so if you've been sort of like socialized female, um, this like, there's certain beauty standards um, that you not don't need to abide by, but like can feel this pressure to abide by. And usually in my life, I'm, I'm getting to a point now where I'm giving less of a shit about, you know, needing to constantly shave my legs or, you know, shave my pits or, you know, have nice looking nails or, you know, having nice eyebrows or junk like that. Right. Um, so it's usually not something that I'm constantly worrying about. It's like, oh, I'll get to it when it starts to bother me. Right. Like when. Yeah, there's like certain points where like I will let, you know, maybe TMI, but I will let my personal grooming get to a point where unless I find it annoying and it pisses me off, then I will deal with it. Like if it just becomes an annoying thing, then I'll be like, I don't like this. This is annoying. I'll deal with it. Right. So I don't, it's usually like it's, I, I don't deal with it until I get annoyed by it. But with this upcoming reception, like, I don't know, I guess you then be, I don't know, when it comes to like big events, like a graduation or a reception or a wedding or a, like even being a guest at a wedding, I was thinking about this the other day, where like there's all of a sudden I'm like, oh my God, shit, do I need to like schedule in grooming and like upholding specific beauty standards and whatever? Because like, because the other day it was a thing where I'm like, uh, when we got married originally, I just like curled my hair. I didn't th like do too much with it. And I think I'll probably do the same thing again, but I'm like, oh, normally, normally when people have like a big formal event, they'll go get their hair professionally done or something like that. And then I'm like, oh man, like do I, and then I'm like, oh, I've not curled my hair in ages. Sometimes you get to a point where like, I don't know if your hair isn't like the right shape or do I have really like split ends or whatever. And I'm like, shit, should I like be booking a haircut right now? Should I be booking like an appointment to do these things? And that's like another thing on top of just general, 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 geez, words, general reception stuff and then general family visiting stuff. And so I'm, I don't know, I go back and forth with like, I think I get in my own head about it and I have to just be like, girl, calm down. Um, so I don't think I'm going to do any of those things, but I think I, sometimes I feel, I don't know, like it's this weird thing where until 
Like, I, I don't care, and I'm pretty good at subverting traditional ideals of feminine beauty socialization and whatever until it comes to things that, I don't know, like the stakes seem higher maybe? There's a potential for like, and again, this is more of like an internal issue maybe. There's like a, like the way people live their everyday lives, it's like whatever. But then when it's like, when it comes to weddings or comes to receptions or things like that, I feel like there's sort of like an air of judgment potentially, like a potential judgment. Sorry, I just like spit granola bra on my hand and that was just me taking it back in. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's like this potential. And again, I don't know. Like, I think people should just be happy for us and enjoy the experience. But there's almost like this unwritten pressure to like do things in a certain way or like present in a certain way for these types of things. And again, as somebody who I guess never really identified as being girly per se, when it comes to stuff like that, I'm like, oh, I guess I get a bit like comparison-y, which is, which is annoying, which is not good. Where I'm like, oh, like I bet, you know, if so-and-so was getting married, like they would be booking, you know, uh, a nail appointment and a hair appointment and they would be doing X, Y, and Z. And should I be doing X, Y, and Z? And is it wrong if I don't? And like that sort of stuff. So I have to actively combat, combat that and be like, it's fine. I don't know if maybe like it might put my mind at ease if I like trial ran. Maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll, I don't know, should I do that tomorrow? I'll trial run curling my hair just to one make sure I still know how to do that. Cause that's the other thing too. If I'm gonna decide like literally the day of the reception, I'm gonna curl my hair. I have not touched my curling iron in a million years. Um, yeah, maybe that's what it is. Maybe it's a lack of familiarity because it's something that I don't do very often. I then get potentially in, I don't know, like insecure about it. Um, I'm literally working through this in real time. <laughs> I'm literally working through this with you guys right this second. Uh, yeah, maybe I should do a trial run of these things so that I feel confident in my ability to execute them and therefore I don't need to feel pressure to outsource that. So maybe that's what we do tomorrow. Not on stream, but before stream. Though that would be kind of interesting because I've never done any capacity of like a get ready with me or anything like that. I feel like that's more of a thing that people do on YouTube. I don't know if there's people that like, I don't know, is there like a get ready with me side of Twitch? I've never considered this. Like I know that there's people who obviously do like, cause there's makeup like beauty YouTubers and stuff like that. But I've, and I've seen them like again on Twitch or on like small, like short form stuff like that. But I'm like, oh, Unless you're doing like effects makeup or like body painting or something like that. I don't know. Is now I'm like, is there, I don't know. Have you guys ever seen like a get ready with me Twitch thing? I don't know. Maybe, I don't, is that, I don't know. Oop. Maybe that's a thing. Now I'm just, con I, not that I'm, not that I'm saying we're going to do it, but I'm just like, oh, that's an interesting thing that I've not known because a lot of stuff on like social media or on Twitch or like, you know, it, it can be cross platform. You know what I mean? Like obviously there's like a longer form streaming version, but like for instance, like playing video games, people will do let's plays on YouTube. They'll do short form content on Instagram or on TikTok, and then they'll do the long form actual stream on Twitch, like those sorts of things. Um, so a lot of content creation can exist. Maybe it'll be slightly adapted and slightly different, but across different platforms. But I've never thought to question. Yeah. Like, is there, cause obviously I feel like it's not as huge as it was like, but like the beauty influencer community on YouTube was huge at some point. Is that a thing here? Is that a thing in like long form streaming content? 
I don't know. Now I'm intrigued. Because I know people will just do like just chatting streams and I'm sure like people will do a just chatting stream where they're like getting ready for their day maybe? I don't know. Aw, <laughs> uh, thank you for hydrating Pando Aurora. Or I guess his name is Phantasmo. That's his name. Thank you for hydrating him. I'm giving him a treat. Oh, he's leveled up! Burr, 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 burr. Look at him go. He's so happy about it. Hello, hello. Good afternoon. How you doing? I hope things are good. I am trying to get through my decoupage. <laughs> Okay, we've done the edges of this one. We can now go back to filling in another one. Yeah, yeah, not too bad. I think we're, we're doing good. I feel like we've been like super in our feels during stream today, um, which not in like a, not in like a cry way, but just in like a very introspective way, which is interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So here, I'll show you what the finished one looks like. So this is, what it's gonna look like. I basically, I'm describing it, it's basically like decorative paper mache. Cause you're taking decorative pieces of paper and ripping them up into tiny pieces and gluing them. And I feel like with paper mache, you do the same thing, but it's meant for like structure. Do you know what I mean? So you're using paper mache to like make a bowl or make a thing. Whereas this is literally just to decorate a thing, which is kind of cool. But yeah, so this is what they look like. It is, that's literally what the, it's called. Um, the, like the, this particular decoupage paper is called like terrazzo. <laughs> um, but yeah, so then the plan after their decoupage is to paint these raised edges white to get a bit more opacity on here. And then we're going to paint these gold. Um, and then we have gold cricket vinyl that we're going to use to put the names of the kids across the boxes. Hi Ray. Good morning. Good morning, how are you? Yeah, cause you know, I, I didn't, I don't know. I guess I was like, oh, I don't, you know, we already made centerpieces for the reception. I, you know, yeah. I don't know why I decided to put another craft on my plate, but I did. They're gonna look cute and I love them, but I think right now I'm in the thick of it. And so I'm like, oh my God, why did I choose to do this? Um, but I know it's gonna look really cute and I'm really excited about it but I'm also kind of in the thick of it. Hence the name of the stream title where I'm like over decoupage. <laughs> but other than that, I'm good. Yeah, I'm doing really good, Ray. Thank you. Um, I don't know if you guys heard earlier. So you know how I had suspicions about my neighbors moving because the female neighbor in the couple was pregnant? I was 100% correct and they moved today and she is pregnant and due in two weeks and they have just moved out. Yeah, so 100%, everything was correct. I got the lowdown from my neighbor's mom because she parked um, in front of our drive and so she was like, oh, is it okay if I park here? And I'm like, yeah, that's fine. And then I was like, so are you guys moving? And they're like, yeah, yeah, they're moving today. They got a place, they got you know a bigger house because they are having another kid and where it was and all this kind of stuff and who who's moving in. So potentially it looks like, so I, you know, I got eyes. I've been like, you know, being a little super sleuthy spy over the last little while. Um, probably being obnoxious in a way, but it sounds like it's a single woman and her like adult son. And so looking at her coming in, yeah, I, that's what we're hoping for. We're hoping, you know, we get some considerate neighbors um, but it looks like it's a woman. Maybe she's like in her fifties or something like that. Um, and I'm then assuming if she's in her fifties, then her son's probably like in his twenties or something like that. Um, but yeah, so that's interesting. So yeah, it was so funny. Cause, cause again, this, this, the neighbor's mom was like, yeah. Um, the, the woman was like, yeah, I've not, cause I, I genuinely have not seen our neighbors very often. Um, and so she's like, yeah, I've been like, you know, wanting to tell Tash, but like literally haven't seen her. And I was like, yeah, I kind of like suspected, but again, like they, it was always like they were coming or going. Like we never had like an, an actual interaction. I would kind of see them like rushing off to stuff 
and I would sort of see her from behind and be like, I'm pretty sure, but I don't want to be that asshole who's assuming something because I've not heard it from the horse's mouth sort of thing. But yeah, can confirm. So yeah, no, I'm hoping, we're hoping for the good neighbors. At least, you know, or at least, you know, quiet neighbors who keep to themselves. That, you know, that's, that's always, it's like either be, be chill or like be invisible, you know? But I don't know. I, I, I literally, I don't know. I don't know if you can get vibes from somebody just by looking at them. I guess you kind of can, but they're also moving in. So it's like, I don't know. I don't know how much you can tell about a person from their moving in style. <laughs> I don't know if that's a thing, but yeah. So I was correct in, in our assumptions. Cause it was just interesting. Cause like we kept on looking online and there was no, they never posted a for sale sign. We were like looking on, on websites and couldn't find a listing. So they obviously did it privately. And then we were, were like thinking, I'm like, oh, if they're like, cause then before I had found out, <laughs> yeah, I don't, but also I hate confrontation. So I will never confront them about their drama, but you best believe I will come here and talk shit about it. <laughs> That's what it is. It's, I will not, yeah, I, I don't like confrontation. So I'm just gonna sit here. I'm just gonna tell you guys the goss and air my grievances here. <laughs> That's what it is. Um, but yeah, so no, it should be good. <laughs> wow, too honest. No. Was that too honest or was it a right amount of honest? And I mean talk shit as in like spill the tea and hot goss. You know what I mean? Because I don't. I'm not a confrontational person. So I would never, you know. I told you the neighbors when when the fence blew out, like our fence panel blew over. It was their fence panel. And they never got around to fixing it until they were planning to move. Um... I never said anything, but Liam and I were both really annoyed that the fence was broken for like a year and a half. But again, we may, you know, so, but yeah. So it was just really interesting. Cause we were like, oh, we've not seen, literally seen anything that would indicate that they were selling. It was just the vibes and the fact that like people were coming around to the house and staying for like, a few minutes um yeah oh are you acting why yeah <laughs> yeah right i'll sick them on you i'll be like yo <laughs> i'm like probagus has something to say <laughs> no i think again it's it's it comes down to like people pleasing, not wanting to rock the boat. Sometimes if you say something and then if, you know, if their reaction isn't good, then it can be awkward. Like, you know, that kind of stuff. And also it's one of those things where it wasn't the end of the world because we had had, we had put an alternative in place. Except when I freaked out about the fact that our yard was ugly because of our fence panels, but that was a different thing. That was like something that was like my own personal mental health issue. Um, I got over that. But yeah, I think if it's just kind of like petty shit like that, though you're right, I think like it would probably, it would have not been fine, but I think, you know, it's probably much more healthy to voice your concerns and your um, grievances in a healthy way, you know, not by getting mean and blowing up at people. It's probably a much more healthy way to, um, walk up to somebody and be like, me and my neighbor, we have a right amount of hate for each other. The moment he came, he was like, a, oh, interesting. I don't even know what that means. What, what is, what is Zeno's? Um, but yeah, no, that's good that, I guess it's good that they were blunt. And that's the thing, like it's never, we never, there was only one incident that I think really sort of like made um, our relationship with our neighbor is kind of awkward, but like when we spoke to them, oh, right. So they don't like foreigners. Well, then your neighbor would hate me. 
Um, yeah. I'm like, I am the foreigner. <laughs> But yeah, no, I do think that there is, it's, it's healthier to bring up grievances than to sit and stew on them. Absolutely. Yeah, I don't like doesn't mean hate, but it's still a, that comes from a place of I don't like people who are not like me in my place, like in my space, you know what I mean? So, I respect them for being blunt about it, but. I don't know, anytime somebody says they don't like a group of people, even if it's like a don't like instead of a hate, I'm like, you sound like not a nice person. Pops in a lurk, hey Kay, I appreciate your lurky lurks. I hope you're having a fabulous Thursday. Keep it real, live your best life. We are decoupaging. Or as I like to call, fancy paper mache, or what is it, aesthetic paper mache. Decorative paper mache, essentially. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. He's a decent fella, no, no, yeah. No, that's fair. It's one of those where I'm like, you know, as long as you keep to, like, that's the thing. There's a difference between like somebody being a decent, like, I think it's possible for somebody to be a good neighbor and not be a good person. Do you know what I mean? So I think you can be a, a good neighbor, like be quiet, be respectful, not make a lot of noise, but you can have a very shitty personality <laughs> you know what i mean i think i think both can be true we're really i've been really exploring the like oxymoronic juxtaposition of life i'm just using random ass words but like things can be both good and bad at the same time you know what i mean it's like this can be a pleasant experience but executed by somebody who's a piece of shit and vice versa somebody can be a really good person well i don't know possibly I would say, yeah, maybe the same thing. You can be a good person. Yeah, because I think people have off days. So you can be a good person, but like be shitty in an instance. You know what I mean? Because everyone has bad days. But you can also be a pleasant person, but your ethos to life can be problematic. <laughs> you know? So it's interesting. Yeah, exactly. So I was, I was talking about it originally in the context of like, um, chill, like childhood TV shows, unlike the one client's neighbor who accused Really? Why? Why? Was it just a point of concern? You're like, hi, I'm gonna look after your dog and when I come to pick them up, I would like to make sure I don't get soaked by your automatic sprinklers, please. You know? I assume that's what the conversation was and they were like, you, you, how do you know we have sprinklers? I'm like, okay. That's interesting. <laughs> But yeah, I was talking about it within the context of, because I've been consuming a lot more of the, you know, nostalgic TV show actors from my childhood um, are now starting podcasts and or coming out about the difficulties they faced being child actors. And so the thing that I think is very interesting is how somebody like can consume a show and can have such incredible happy memories associated with the show. The example I have is like iCarly, for instance. People loved iCarly, they grew up with iCarly, it was incredible, amazing to them. 
And then you have you read Jeanette McCurdy's book. And she absolutely hated the character that she portrayed because it absolutely exacerbated a lot of negative mental health symptoms with her. You know what I mean? And so that's really interesting that it's like, this can be both a beloved character and something that carries deep beloved nostalgia for generations and actually be not a happy experience for the people that are creating it. Happy for you, the consumer, but not happy for the creator or the entertainer is interesting to me. Are you looking for water? Yeah. <laughs> like, okay, it wasn't really my business how long the sprinklers were gonna be in a dr Oh. Oh, okay. Oh, so you asked them like, was it one of those things where they were kind of like their sprinklers were on and you were kind of like, um, yo, was it like a hose ban or something? Was it one of those things where you were like, um, you're, why, like, you know, like, I know what you mean, where you're kind of like, this isn't supposed to be happening right now. And then they got defensive being like, how I choose to illegally do things during a drought is my own business. You know what I mean? So that kind of happened here too. Again, because I hate confrontation. I never would have brought it up. But I know we were in a hose ban for a long time last year. And there were still people out washing their cars. And it's like, no, no. The point of a hose ban is that there isn't enough resources for you guys to be doing superficial shit with water. So that was... So I remember them. There was a the whole thing being like, do not water your lawn. Do not wash your cars. Like the reserves for the water are low because we're in a drought. So do not waste it on superficial stuff. So it sounds like that person was just getting defensive because you were like, yo dude, probably shouldn't be watering your grass. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so you were kind of like, oh wow, these have been on for a long time. Like, is that okay? Yeah. So it was more like you were concerned like, oh, hey dude, your sprinklers are still on. And they were like, what the fuck do you know about my sprinklers? Interesting. So yeah, I guess, you, you know, don't be a concerned citizen. <laughs> it sounds like. Don't, don't be a concerned citizen. Yeah. That sucks though. That, cause that, that's an awkward experience. Cause that's the thing where like, when you have really genuine good intentions for something and someone completely takes the wrong assumption of something that can feel really uncomfortable. And you know, low key threatening to follow your, you know. Yeah, but you know. <laughs> but threatening to follow you back to your house is kind of awkward. And also not being funny guys, like especially in the current climate in the US where it seems like everybody just be shooting up everybody for nothing. I would not, yeah. If somebody like threatens you, I would take that very seriously. So I'm, I'm glad nothing happened to you, um, first of all. Yeah, I don't know. There's some wild shit happening right now. But yeah, I'm like, I am not a confrontational person and I would definitely never be a confrontational person in the States. No, thank you. No, no. I don't think that's necessary. I don't know, I'm really, I'm like, I'm really not, oh, <laughs> there we go. Okay, you scared me for a second, Probacus. I was like, are we gonna have to have the awkward conversation that I'm really not about that gun life and it makes me really uncomfortable? And then you were like, no, don't worry. Airsoft is fine. We will accept that. 
If it was a Nerf gun, I'd be even happier. <laughs> I'm like, you, yeah, you, you were, yeah. And Grease Gun Laws are zero. Oh, so you have, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, you guys can't, you guys don't have gun, like, you guys are not allowed to have guns in, in Greece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. That's good. Yeah. It's like, it's similar. I think there's like, yeah. It's like similar to the U US or to the, to the UK and Canada. Though I think, I don't know, people try to fuck around in Canada in terms of their ability to carry guns and stuff. Like you can have hunting rifles and things like that. And I'm like, you know, that's fine. It's not a semi-automatic weapon where you can kill millions of, like not millions, but kill multiple people in like five seconds flat. You know what I mean? It was honestly a bit scary at the time. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that is scary, Kay. Nope, nope, nope. Yeah, yeah, only hunters. Yeah, that makes sense. And that's the thing too. And that's the thing, right? It's like, yeah, if you if you are hunting, and that's the thing. Like again, I'm not, I'm not, I don't, I don't like any guns, but I respect the fact that you know, hunting is a thing, and I think you know, in some instances, in some capacities, it's very important um for overpopulation and for you know i think people should be empowered to make their own food and stuff um but yeah when it comes to other things i'm like nah that's that doesn't make sense but yeah anywho yeah no problem lurky lurk away thank you for stopping by and i'm sorry you had a really scary experience fuck that guy but don't let him hear us say that because then he's gonna follow us There are not many hunters, yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah, to be fair, that is a thing. Like, yeah, it's one of those where there are certain pockets of that, because that is what's happening again in Canada as well and happening actually in my hometown too. Um, where there is still, yeah, there's like illegal arms dealing and things like that. But as a whole, you don't have like your Joe Schmo neighbor walking around with the Glock to go to breakfast at Denny's. You know what I mean? <laughs> like it's a little bit different. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, I didn't mean to cut that section there. That's fine. Okay, so this has a natural crease, so I'm cutting the crease section just to give me another straight edge so I can then continue with that. Actually, have I finished the bottom of this box yet? Let's assess. No, I have not. We should probably do that first. <laughs> I'm the air pass me some air excuses. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I think it's just something I like struggle with in general. Cause like my, my partner and like his family and everyone, like everyone's really big into like air, like um, airsoft guns and like Nerf guns or Nerf guns and things like that. And I get it's like fine, um, but it is, it's like this weird thing where when you really stop to think about it, 
where it's like you're playing pretend shooting each other and I get it's with like soft bullets and things like that, but it's like, I don't know. I think if I think about it too hard, I'm like really not into that concept. Um, but, but then I guess then too, then I would need to tackle, you know, I think that laser tag is cool, but again, that's sort of like a sci-fi version of guns, you know what I mean? And so it's kind of like, okay, I think the biggest thing, like, growing up, the things that my, like, my family would always say is it's like, okay, if you're gonna have, like, one of those toy guns or whatever, it's like you never point them at people's faces. Um, that's for safety reasons, but all, like, you know what I mean? Like, it was mainly for safety reasons, but that's also just, like, you know, it, it almost, like, feels malicious if you're going for the face. And you're like, no, potentially hurting somebody badly, even if it, like, it shouldn't be funny. You know what I mean? But yeah, I don't know. I have a lot of complicated feelings around toy guns. It was something that we never, like, my parents, like, we never had them growing up. Um, like a little, I think when we were like a little bit older, but I've never, I don't know. It's something I've, it's, it's a blind spot that I have that I don't enjoy or like or if i do enjoy it it's like okay never at people but then i guess the idea of a nerf gun fight doesn't yeah mm. that makes sense obviously yeah like when it comes to those sorts of things is that one of those things that you have yeah do you have, so is it like you have, manda it's similar in Austria where you have a mandatory military service when you turn a certain age or you have to do like a, um, like a civilian service. So it's like more of like a volunteer based thing as opposed to like a militarized thing. So I'm assuming does that, does then Greece have the same thing where you have the mandatory military participation? Yeah, 12 months, yeah. You did a 36, yeah. I have a friend who, who's in who's in the in the military. Like that's something that... You, when you turn 16. Oh, okay, yeah. When you turn 16, if you don't pursue higher education, yeah. But if you, you have to go for the 12 months, I guess that makes sense, yeah. It's sort of like another, if you're, yeah. I think it's similar to, um, I can't remember if in Austria, like if you were, even if, like if you had to do it, even if you did eventually pursue higher education, I'm not sure. I can't remember. I, I had an ex who was from Austria. That's the only reason I have like a, some sort of context into that. And we were like in high school at the time going into university. So that was on like the the radar because a bunch of his friends and stuff were ending up having to do that at a certain point. You have to go for 12. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that makes sense. Like, honestly, I'm sure there's a lot of, um, financial incentive to, again, like you said, do, do a longer, a longer term especially depending on like what the job market is like and what you want to do afterwards and stuff like that. I could see, I could see the appeal, um, in terms of financial stability and responsibility and all that kind of stuff. You get pretty good training. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I think that was the appeal for, for my friend. Um, I've never asked him about it, but I think my partner has told me about it where like, and actually too, I know of some people who end up, um, in Canada or in the UK or elsewhere, because if you go to like a military university or college, they'll then pay for your education, um, in, in like with, with the understanding that you then will serve, um, for a certain period of time. So again, I can see that being a very lucrative thing for people, especially like with, um, in certain places with like post-secondary education fees and stuff like that. So yeah. Hmm. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Especially like you said, if, if it's not, um, 
if you're not pursuing like post-secondary education or something like that um that does seem like the most lucrative financial option unless i don't know what like what, what if you guys have like a living wage for your like you know minimum wage jobs and stuff if it's like a livable wage like people can live off of working at like a place like mcdonald's because obviously they can't do that here which is bullshit you can go do it yeah definitely that too hi and day 15 months oh my goodness wild we've been through so much together it's amazing <laughs> how are you doing how's your day going how's your afternoon how's your week how is life how are you what what's new how are things <laughs> i hope things are good yeah 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 it, oh there's a hundred different ways to do that absolutely absolutely it can be a way to save up for uni it can be a way like of a gap year it can be oh yeah yeah no i am i'm not knocking it i just you know i personally just have issues with those things so that's something that i would be difficult i would struggle to do um but i think it's totally acceptable when other people do it off to a furry con. Ooh, that's amazing. How have you made progress? I know you were redesigning your main, like your main one, um, with the eyes and stuff. Have you? Have I think because you were you streamed that the other day where you were working on the eyes. Did you finish them? What sort of next step? Oh, cool. I also applied for a craft stall, but only one for one day as the pop up three. That's cool. Oh, at the con as well? That's amazing. That's really cool. That's my favorite thing about conventions is like artist alley craft stall stuff. That's truly the coolest part of conventions in my opinion. That's what I did. Oh, cool. Oh, no way. You're about to finish. Oh, cool, cool. Congr like preemptive congrats. Oh, engineering is, is a tough gig, man. My, my dad and my brother are both engineers of different varieties. My dad was a mining engineer. He's retired now. And my brother is a computing systems engineer, I think. Something like that. But yeah, oh, I know engineers, mechanical. I think my friend's sister's a civil engineer. Kudos to you, man. That's a lot of maths. That's a lot of maths and such. <laughs> Good for you. I also spent the past week brushing on my wall. Oh, amazing. Yeah. Oh, cool, cool, cool. That makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah, it's always interesting to me um, with engineering because I, I don't know if it's similar in Greece because I know in Canada, everyone, I think, starts for the first two, three years um, all together. I think it's actually the first two years. So the first two years, it's all like general engineering. Um, and then you specialize, right? And so it's interesting what type of engineering people choose to specialize in. So like everyone will start with a particular cohort and then you'll go off into like your sort of specialist areas. So I don't know if that was similar to you where you sort of start out with a group of people and then you all sort of separate and get more specialized as you continue with your education. Um, or if you start on a track and then that's what you're doing. Mm -hmm. That's what you do here as well. Oh yeah. Oh, you can specialize in, in AI? Oh, that's interesting for engineering. I guess that makes sense, probably. Probably if you end up in like the computing system side of engineering and then you can almost pick like a, a even niche or specialization within that. That's really interesting. That's cool. Noon Day, what sort of merch stuff are you gonna be making for the con? Are you gonna be doing, is it gonna be like wool stuff? Are you gonna be crocheting or knitting for it or? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You have to take... Oh, interesting. Oh, you do have to take that. Well, it's so funny. That's so interesting because I know, like, my, my partner, he um, has a computer science degree. Um, and, and he's been working in his field for, like, over a decade now. And it's so interesting because obviously, and so he he's reflecting on the fact, like, the stuff that he learned in university, like, the coding languages he's learned are completely obsolete now. They don't use them 
in the field. But because he's actively working in the field, at, like it then becomes like you you learn the new things through experience and on the job stuff. Um, Cause yeah, he was like, yeah, some of the stuff that I've learned now because technology advances so quickly um, that yeah, what by the time, you know, what he learned. And I think too, probably as technology, the turnaround time for that becomes so much quicker. I'm sure like what you learn in like your, your year one potentially could be partially outdated by the time you graduate. Like that's how quick the turnaround time is getting now with techno like technological advancements. It'll be very interesting, like what a computer science degree would look like now versus when my partner took the program. Crochet velvet plushies. Oh, that's so cool. Gonna make a bunch of embroidered patches. Oh, amazing. So are the plushies gonna be like in, I guess, are they gonna be similar to like, um, uh, like different kind of furry archetypes? I assume there's probably like certain types of creatures that would then be that thing, right? Border patches too. Very cool. I'm so excited for you. That's gonna be amazing. Not gonna lie. I'm gonna pro yeah. So upskill, reskill. That's cool. Plushies like um like stuffed toys, like stuff stuffed animals. But because they're not teddy bears, they get the they get the term plushy. Soft, soft, cuddly creatures, <laughs> aka plushies. That's cool. Okay. Oh, mushies, bees. That's cute. Oh my god. I want a mushy. I want a mushy plushie. <laughs> I want a mushy plushie. Oh, floof. Yes, exactly. Floof. Cuddly floof. <laughs> exactly, Probacus. Exactly. Oh shit, guys. It's already six o'clock. Well, gosh diddly darn. Time flies when we're having fun, eh? Time flies. Well, we did not finish anything. <laughs> we, yeah. But we made progress. PM, PM, 1800 hours. <laughs> yeah. We streamed for three hours. We started at three. We had a bit of tech issues, but we, we figured it out. And then it's gone for cute. So yeah, I'm thinking of getting a wicker basket. Ooh, and then putting bees in. That's cute. Prof told me once that a college degree mainly proves it. Truly, yeah. I think that's what it is. And somebody told me it's kind of like, it's to show that you have you can commit to something long-term and like, yeah, achieve, achieve like a long-term commitment. Cause yeah, the knowledge will change and the best practices will be updated, but your ability to do research and do critical thinking of a topic and be able to have discussions and stuff like that. Like those are transferable skills, even if the individual minute knowledge changes. So yeah, definitely. Well shit guys, um, does anyone have any raid suggestions? We'll, uh, we'll simmer down for the evening, but we'll be back here tomorrow. We'll be back here tomorrow, same time. It's weird being obsolete. Yeah, mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. I guess to be far, it can, well, in certain instances, it can be difficult to, like, if the, if, it's really, cause some places post-secondary education is really expensive. And so you're like, if I'm just going to learn how to learn, I don't know if it's worth $30,000 of my time. You know what I mean? But Church of Poe, okay, let's take a look. What are they up to? What do they do? What are they up to? Oh, Satchel Max, Church of Poe. Cool, cool, cool. Let's see, what are the peeps up to? The maths stay with you. You say the maths stay with you. The maths left my brain as soon as I finished my stats class. Um, yeah. Went in one ear and out the other, my friend. <laughs> okay, let's. Oh my goodness, guys, we have so many new friends we can potentially visit. Let's 
see. Mass needs it. Yeah, that's true. You do need, it's one of those like use it or lose it. I think it's similar to languages, you know? Use it or lose it. I can think of nothing I would enjoy less than practicing math for one to two hours a week. I would enjoy nothing less. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Okay, let's see. Well, I think Noonday beat us with a punch with Satchel Max. We'll take a look at what they're doing. Nothing more. Yeah? No. Isn't it the opposite? I always get those things confused. You know when people say, like, I couldn't care less or I could care less? I think it's a similar one where I'm like, oh, is it nothing more? I could, or I would enjoy nothing more. Or not, yeah, or I would enjoy nothing less. I'm not sure. No, but genuinely, listen. Listen, you. <laughs> yeah, but it's, I don't know, it's interesting. Honestly, it was a genuine concern of mine, so it's fine. She only just started, but she knits and sews. Oh, cute. Highly caffeinated individuals are really knitting and sewing in books. Cute. She looks like, I don't know, from what she's pointing at, it looks like maybe she's gonna be crocheting a little f squirrel. Yeah, I'm looking at that too, guys. I love me some, she's making, she's making a floof. She's making a woodland floof. And I think we should go and support and watch the floof. Or perhaps what you'd enjoy more is doing nothing. It's true. It's true. <laughs> nothing more means I'm content with that. I didn't know, yeah. Nothing more means I'm content with, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. English do you, honestly, Probascus, that is, a truer statement has never been spoken. English do be weird. English, honestly, the fact that people speak it as a second language, genius. Geniuses, like honestly, it is one of the hardest languages to learn. We have so many rules with so many exceptions. And oh my God, somebody's raiding. Oh my God. Oh no, Sutherland, hello friend, hello Pat. We were literally just about to raid out, but we can hang out in chitty chat for a hot minute. How you doing? How are things? Yeah, exactly, exactly. We will get there, we will get there, but we will say hi. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. It's the Trinity Greek. Yeah. Honestly. Not to talk about slightly before. Yeah, you did. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. It's all good. How are you? How was your stream? What were you working on? I know you've been doing some weird pumpkins. I know you've been doing some drawings. So I don't know, were you in the digital space or were you in the were you in the sculpting space today? Guys, if you're not following Pat, I don't know what you guys need to. You need to just do me a favor and follow this amazing human being, fellow Canadian, fellow Northern Ontarian. So we have similar vibes. <laughs> We're drawing merfolk, oh cool. Trying to make up for this, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's so cool. Trying to make up for things. Oh, that's good. I'm sorry you're not feeling well though. Hopefully you're at the tail end of the cold. That's always so annoying when you're just like on the struggle bus. <laughs> on the, on the, on the, uh, yeah, body struggle bus. It's not fun. So I appreciate you pushing through. Oh, hello. Shadow's being very patient right now. Here, do you wanna see? Let's see, let's show you. Let's see if you can see him. There he is. Say hi, Shadow. Okay, boop. Here he is, hopefully you should, oh yeah. And that's hard when you're streaming because then you're talking and stuff and then your throat is like grating on you. So yeah, I can see that being a real pain in the ass. You're being a very good boy. You're being very chill. Oh, oh no, I've awakened the beast. I've awakened the beast within. 
watch her and be like, listen. Hello. If you guys haven't met Shadow, this is Shadow. He's my two-year-old lurcher. Oh, I'm sorry, do you want my granola bar? Good goal. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so this is my baby boy he's been very good he's a long boy <laughs> yeah so that's what's up <laughs> that's what's up that's what's happening mm -hmm. shadow is what is it, 76% Greyhound? We did a doggy DNA test. When we got him, we were told he was a Springer door. We've had him since he was a puppy. And then he got longer and taller. And we're like, there's no way in hell you are mixed with a Springer Spaniel or a Labrador. So, what's up? <laughs> so we did a doggy DNA test. Decoupage, you know what? I'm sure it's a French word. Um, let's look up the official term, but I am assuming a lot of these paper crafts, because paper mache, mache is also a French word, but let's look up the official definition of decoupage. Because for me, it's like literally this is a decoupage meaning. It is the art of decorating surfaces by applying cutouts as of paper and then coating with usually several layers of finish, such as lacquer or varnish. Literally from the Merriam-Webster dictionary. Straight from the source. Straight from the source. Yeah, no problem. Honestly, thank you so much, Pat. Please take care of yourself. Obviously, raid and run. Take care. Do the things. I appreciate you stopping by. And yeah, we'll raid and run somewhere else. But we will, we will, you know, you'll be with us in spirit as you go and take care of your scratchy ass throat. <laughs> but yeah, thank you for stopping by. I appreciate you so much. And I hope you feel better soon. But yeah, literally from it. The technique of decorating something with cutouts of paper, linoleum, plastic, or other flat material over which varnish or lacquer is applied. So decoupage, I guess, is a process. It is the process of applying paper with glue to a thing. Hopefully that answered your question. <laughs> All right, let's go watch them create, who is this? Satchel Max. Okay. This is the raid message. Oh, let's do it properly. Excellent. I'm glad. <laughs> yeah. Let's do the raid. Let's find, let's go meet a new friend. We are going to be back here on Friday. We're going to be cross stitching. I've not cross stitched in a hot minute. We have a very neglected, um, party phantasma cross stitch sitting on my computer desk just you know in dire need of some stitching so we're gonna go make that happen tomorrow we'll be back here um i'm gonna spiral into a decoupage frenzy tonight and i will report back on if i got any more completed <laughs> once we leave each other today enjoy the rest of your day guys i hope you have a fabulous evening morning afternoon whatever time of day it is with you Stay hydrated, live your best life, and I'll see you all tomorrow. Bye!